coach. Asked him how he was feeling. He said, hey, Mark, I'm above ground getting paid with a check. Can't be much better than that. Fred Goldsmith, meanwhile, in his third season, 11 and 13, hoping to notch his first win of 96 this afternoon. Duke won the toss, electing to defer. Northwestern will receive. This is Sims Lenhart with the kickoff. Back deep, Hudefa Ismaili. Ismaili finds a seam at the 35. Ismaili pushed out of bounds at the 48-yard line. An auspicious beginning for Northwestern. Finally pushed out by Sims Lenhart, the place kicker. Steve Snur, the starting quarterback, last week, 21 of 32. He has improved his arm strength over the offseason as well. Yeah, they've really worked on it, and he's worked on his delivery as well. Craig Johnson, the quarterback coach, told me he's trying to make Steve throw with a little more compact delivery, and it's, a, it's a, definitely had a positive impact on his accuracy. First down and 10 after that 44-yard return. The nose of the ball at the 46 for the Wildcats. Tucson Waterman in motion. They hand it off to Darnell Autry. Running over the right, left guard and tackle over Chapman and Janus. Tackled by Kenan Holly. A look at the Chili's backs and receivers featuring Darnell Autry, number 24, the guy to keep your eye on today. No surprise, he had the first carry of the day. Everything the Wildcats do offensively emanates from Darnell Autry. The play action, the counters, and he can really carry the load for them. And the offensive line laden with senior talent. And the best of the seniors right there, Brian Cardos, is a, one of the best offensive linemen in the Big Ten. Autry and McGrew, the fullback, in the offset eye. Play fake this time. Schnur with tons of time to throw. Now he decides to run it, and Schnur steps out of bounds at midfield right at the 50-yard line, run out by Kevin Lewis, a member of that Blue Devil defense. There's a look at the front seven. Billy Granville, an interesting story, returning after being suspended for four games last season. He's a very intense, aggressive inside linebacker. He plays with an attitude, Mark. And the backs on the corner, some talent. Holly, a guy to watch, a returning starter, along with Settles. And the secondary, keep in mind, they held Florida State to 92 yards passing last week. That's their lowest output in 15 years, and you saw it there where Schnur had no place to go with the football on second down. Third down and five to go for the Wildcats. Schnur gets it off in time, complete to Tucson Waterman, and he has the first down at the 42-yard line. Desi Thomas, number 24, making the tackle for Duke. And Northwestern moves the sticks on its first possession of the ball game. Waterman, a 6'2", 212-pound senior from Pontiac, Michigan, a physical receiver. Yeah, that's right. He can break tackles. He caught one ball last week. It's funny, he caught it in the first quarter, so they get the ball to him in the first quarter. I'm sure he'd like to get the ball more in his hands this week. First down and 10. Two receivers out to the top of your screen. That's number five, Dwayne Bates, closest to the quarterback. McGrew in motion. Little counter step by Autry, takes it up the middle. Autry plowing his way over the 35, down to the 33-yard line. Darnell Autry showing you some strength right there. He's a big guy at 210 pounds, tackled by Darius Clark. Split tackle, Brian Cardos, number 78, firing off inside and getting a good push along with his offensive guard. He chipped, and then he came back down on a boon away. So Cardos is going to play away from the tight end. He's the split tackle, the senior, 6'5", 302 pounds. Good football player. It is second down and two to go. McGrew in motion. Autry again to the short side of the field. Autry has the first down. A flag thrown at the 35-yard line. Autry with the first down falls forward to the 26. McGrew comes in motion. He's a lead blocker most of the time on this offense. Trying to locate the hold. It looks like 74. Janus got called with the hold. Let's see if we can pick up 74. You see the takedown on the left side of your screen, and that was the hold that was called by the umpire. That run by Autry negated. He's elusive, though, isn't he, Mark? I mean, a, a small back, 5'10". He's really muscular. He's put about five pounds. Gained some speed this offseason, but he's able to run inside, and those kind of backs usually with that kind of size uh, are not that durable, but he is extremely durable. An invaluable part of that offense. Second down and 12 after the infraction. A draw play to Audrey. Nothing doing on this play. He may have lost a yard. Brian McCormick 
the 6'6", 245-pound sophomore making the tackle. So many good youngsters on this defense for Duke. Brian McCormick, just one of them. He played as a true freshman last year. There's probably some true freshmen right there. Let's see if they do that in late November. Yeah, a lot of freshmen and sophomores on that Duke team. You know, actually, 17 of the 22 starters are either freshmen or sophomores for Duke. It's third down and 13. Let's see what this young Duke defense can do. Sure, with time, complete to Bates. And Bates is down at the 30-yard line by Desi Thomas. A pickup of 15 on the play. And that'll be good enough for a first down again for Northwestern. Bates will be coming from the right side of the screen. And the reason he has so much time to throw this football, Schnur, is because of the great protection he gets. There's Bates coming across from right to left. And he just goes from one zone to the other and does the excellent job of breaking a tackle there by Desi Thomas and getting even a little bit more yardage. First and 10 from the 30 for Northwestern on its opening drive of the afternoon. Archery. Looking to get to the perimeter, breaks one tackle, breaks two, and Darnell Autry is going to take it to the house. Touchdown, Wildcats. Got to watch that taunt. That was close. They're getting a little bit more liberal with that this year. They're letting kids get away with a little more, but he wasn't showboating. Maybe. Autry on a 30-yard scamper to hit pay dirt, and Northwestern taking a 6-0 lead. This is a consistent back. Look how strong he is. With that kind of strength and that kind of power, that's why he has had 14 consecutive 100-yard guard games. And the way he started off this afternoon, John, he's a good bet to make that 15. Goins in for the extra point. And he hits the upright. It's no good. Goins was perfect a week ago on his field goal attempts and his extra points, but this time he hits the upright. Nonetheless, Northwestern off to a good start. They lead six to nothing. Duke wide receiver Mark Wilson, the Duke Sports Hall of Fame, and much more. Be sure and purchase a copy of the Darnell Autry stretching out on the sidelines after that 30-yard touchdown run. Ran four times for 38 yards. This is Richmond Flowers on the return. Has it knocked loose at the 27. And that's where Duke will start its opening drive of the afternoon. One of the staples of the offense for the Wildcats is the zone blocking play. This is an inside blocking play where all the players just zone their blocks in the offensive line. And Darnell Autry just can read, and then he finds the hole himself. Lowers the shoulder, and again with the strength and power. I guess that's what jarred his back a little bit. That's why he's stretching on the sidelines. That might rattle his bones a little bit. And there's a look at the starting quarterback, Matt Raider, a.k.a. Red Raider. 6'5", 220-pound sophomore with four wide receivers on the first play of the ball game. Quick three-step drop, completes the pass to Jeff Hodrick, number nine. Barry Gardner making the tackle. Now a look at the Chili's backs and receivers for the Duke Blue Devils. Rico Owens, number three, an integral part of their offense. Mark Wilson caught 47 passes a year ago. Yeah, he reads coverages very well. All these receivers do. They know where to expect the football. That offensive line, John, is young. I mean, they have Snoopy lunchboxes still. <laughs> Chad Malita has got to settle them down. The big right guard. Second down and six, four wideouts again. This time they run it up the middle. That's Lamar Marshall, number 32, the 5'11", 210-pound junior, runs into that front seven. Casey Daly making the tackle, number 36. And number 51, Pat Fitzgerald. Pat Fitzgerald guaranteed that today's result would be different. He felt that, John, they didn't play for each other last week. He reads his keys better than any linebacker in all of college. And Eric Collier has got to settle down the secondary, which was torched late in the game last week for the winning touchdown by Wake Forest. Victimized in a big way. Third down, three to go for Duke. Out of the backfield, complete. Marshall drilled and falls forward for the first down at the 40-yard line. Tough running by Lamar Marshall. But he got the first down. Barnes and Collier making the stop. 
That did not look very pretty at the very beginning. But Lamar Marshall gets a block inside and is able to cut underneath that block. Right there, he cuts back underneath Gannon Shepard, 69. Now watch 56. Keep rolling it. Watch 56 here come in and send a message. There's a freshman. The other freshman, Austin Smith, who came through and made a nice hit downfield. He's hustling. These freshmen uh, are excited about playing here today. Sure are. Owens in motion. Raider finds his receiver. That's the tight end, number 86, Gerald Ford. Not sure whether he's a Democrat or a Republican, but he made a nice catch that time, a pickup of 11 yards. Mike Nelson making the tackle. Well, I like the way Matt Rader has come out so far. He's completed his first three passes. This is a play action play, and he sets his feet. He finds his second receiver downfield, takes the hit, but puts it to Gerald Ford, who doesn't look pretty in practice, but all he does is get it done in the game. And that's why he's in there. And his first down, this is Marshall again. Cutting it up inside, over the left side of the line, down to the 44-yard line. Eric Collier making the tackle. Duke looking to continue its string of successive victories over Northwestern. Right now, that string stands at six. They played just six times, too. Well, I like the way Duke has run the offense so far here today. They look so much better than they did last week against Florida State. If I'm the Wildcat coaches, I'm concerned because they're giving up yards on the run or against the rush uh, so far. It's something Wake Forest did very effectively against this Wildcat defense. Four wideouts again, John. Single back set. That's Marshall behind the quarterback, Matt Rader. Rader this time overthrows his intended receiver. Let's check in with John Saunders back in New York. Matt Rader's He's going to let us Mark, as you know, you guys had a touchdown on your opening drive. We had one in this game as well between BYU and Washington. Rashawn Sheehy from four yards out punches this one just across the plane. And Washington has taken the lead 7-zip over BYU. Mark. Washington with a big game next week against Arizona State, which is where it will be. Third down and five. Four wideouts again. Raider to pass. Completes it to number nine, Jeff Hodrick. Hodrick, a great all-around athlete, making the catch that time. Tackled by Pat Fitzgerald, number 51. Pat Fitzgerald, number 51, made the stop for Northwestern. Yeah, you know, Barnett is definitely realizing that this team is, uh, you know, everybody's getting up for Northwestern. Everybody has pointed to this game on their schedule. And I'll tell you what, I am very impressed with Matt Rader so far in this game. That was a difficult throw, right side of the field, back across the grain, and he hit uh, Hodrick. Duke moving the ball very well today, 13 yards rushing all of last week. They have equal that total today, and a nice catch, and he's still on his feet. Joe Oponek. Opalenic making the catch. Brought down finally at the 13-yard line. A 23-yard pickup by Joe Opalenic. Opalenic works one-on-one -on -one with Josh Barnes, number 17. Northwestern had problem tackling in the open field last week, and it seems to plague them so far here. Maybe it's a problem against ACC teams, but Opalenic does an excellent job of working inside of Barnes and gaining another 10 or 15 yards after the catch. Marshall the one back, and he gets the call. Lamar Marshall spinning down to the 10-yard line, maybe the 9, Casey Daly, number 36, the 6'3", inch, 241-pound senior, making the tackle on that play. Hey, those offensive linemen are playing well. Gannon Shepard, the left tackle, the freshman, Austin Smithwick. I mean, those aren't football names either. Austin Smithwick, that's somebody who should be playing polo. <laughs> A croquet. <laughs> Look at that, 40 freshmen, 25 sophomores. They are loaded and they're pointing down the future, but the future could be now. Yeah, the Pampers posse, huh? Marshall, right down Main Street, stopped up at the 12-yard line. It's gonna set up third down and about five to go. They've gotta to get to the three for a first down. Gardner and Scharf. A couple of linebackers in on the tackle that time. Lamar Marshall last season gained 708 yards. Has good speed, too. There's another youngster you'll see coming behind him, Latavius Wilkes, who's a true freshman who adds a little different dimension in that running back position. They call it the B-back. Single back here at Duke. 
Third down and four. This is the 11th play of Duke's opening drive. Raider on the quarterback draw. Close to the first down, and he puts it on the ground. Is it ruled a fumble, yes or no? The official's going to say that he was down first. Eric Collier made the tackle. And it's a first down for Duke. A good safe call inside with a young quarterback starting his first game. Matt Raider's not exactly quick of foot, but he knows exactly where he needs to go. All the receivers are out, and they caught Northwestern in a blitz. And watch how he fights for this extra yardage. Keep fighting forward, keep fighting forward. Now the ball comes down, he's down, he reaches out, and that got him the first down. So that's a headsy play by the quarterback. A quarterback who coaches describe as quiet, reserved, and cool. And so far, he has been poised on this opening drive. Marshall, the lone back. Two tight end set, ace formation. Play fake. Western snuffs the drive in the end zone. Tim Sharp, number 52 with the pick. My, does that hurt. If you're Duke, that's Marks. They tr tried to get the ball to Jeff Hodrick on the play action pass, and Tim Sharp was just there. Go ahead and roll it. The play action comes. They try to get everybody absorbed inside. Now, see Hodrick, number nine, coming in. But Sharp, I mean, the quarterback can't even look over there. And I'll tell you what, Hodrick probably hurt him a little bit by drifting that far over to the left side of the field. I'm sure he had to stay more straight up the field but got bumped inside. And that's why the weak side linebacker, Tim Sharp, was able to pick that ball off. John, they used up 12 plays, 522 on the clock, and come away with zero points. He'll have to be on Donta, though, to come back. 6 nothing. Well, we return. His lineup right here. He's going to break inside. He gets bumped too far inside, and the weak side linebacker, Tim Scharf, is able to drift over and make the interception. Play action pass. There's Hodrick. Now, see, he needs to go straight up the field, but he drifts too far over. There's Tim Scharf to make the play. Snuffs out a very good drive by Duke. Yeah, a drive that... And there's David, David Green is consoling him and saying, hey, that was a good drive. You did a great job, and, you know, there's somebody you never even saw who picked that ball up. Don't worry about it. They have 91 yards so far. Actually, 70 so far. They used 91 yards on last week. Autry being pushed out of bounds. Brian McCormick pushing Autry out of bounds. Last week against Florida State, Duke had four turnovers, and the Seminoles cashed them into 24 points. See what Northwestern can do with this opportunity. The nose of the ball on the 26-yard line. A look at Raider on the sidelines who throw that interception moments ago. But if I'm Fred Goldsmith, I'm pleased with the way he conducted himself in that first drive, even though he threw the interception. Second down and four, Autry. Looking for space, brought down at the 27, 28-yard line, make that. Autry finding a tough time on the left side. Brian McCormick and Curtis Bunch helping out on the tackle that time for Duke. You know, neither one of these teams are good enough to be able to, you see six rushes for 7.7 average for Autry, but neither one is good enough to be able to overcome mistakes. They don't have the depth of talent. They don't have the great players, the breakaway players. They have to play air-free football and win with that kind of consistency. And neither one did it last week. The Wildcats in their run last year had one of the best turnover margins in the country. And they sure were. Autry gets the call on third down and short. And he'll have the first down. Autry out over the 30, falling forward to about the 32-yard line. First down, Northwestern. Ken and Holly making the tackle that time for Duke. Get used to hearing Autry's name. He averaged uh, 27 carries a game last year, 32 in the first game last week. I'm not afraid. Barnett is not afraid to give the ball to that young man. Autry coming into the game with a bruised shoulder. First down and 10. Schnurr has time to throw. Complete to Dwayne Bates. And Bates falls to the 47. Another Wildcat first down. 
Darius Clark making the tackle in the secondary, the strong safety. You know, that action by the line and by Autry really holds those linebackers up front and allows Bates to come in behind everything. Schnur very accurate so far in this game. He had some uh, overthrows early in the game last week against Wake Forest, which hurt their offense. Actually threw three interceptions, and he only threw six all of last year. And John Bates now has 1,000 yards receiving in his career at Northwestern. Last year had 49 receptions. This is Autry. Cut down right near the line of scrimmage. May have gotten one yard. Chris Ruzik making the stop. Ruzik number 96 right there on your screen. A 6'3", 260-pound sophomore. Looks like Chad Pugh, number 77, the split guard, is having a little problem. He's hobbled there at midfield, and the trainers are about to come out to assist him. Remember that offensive line for Northwestern with a lot of experience. Duke's defense on the field. Bob Trott, the defensive coordinator, telling us that the strength of this Duke defense, and they did play very well last week against Florida State, the strength of the defense is that they all run to the ball. That's something that they preach here at Duke. And uh, Fred Goldsmith adding that, you know, they're so young on defense, John, but youth is a positive in that it's easier to get them on the same page and then they can flourish together. Oh, yeah, this team is going to grow and gel together as they enjoy some success. And I think certainly last week's game is a game, even though they had 44 points scored against them, Florida State average starting on their own uh, or the other 45-yard line. There's Chad Pugh. He'll be replaced by Kevin Peterson, who played real well last week against Wake Forest. Peterson, number 72, also, I might add, a senior. Gary Barnett. Pondering this drive, McGrew and Autry lining up in the offset eye. Schnur auto bling at the line of scrimmage. Little option, keeps himself. Crosses midfield to the 49-yard line of Duke. Holly making the stop. Well, Monday night, Al Michaels hosts an action-packed, heart-stopping primetime special showcasing the greatest sports moments of all time. And Jim Kelly and the Buffalo Bills travel to Three Rivers Stadium to avenge last year's playoff loss against the AFC champion Pittsburgh Steelers on ABC's NFL Monday Night Football. That's all Monday night right here on ABC. And I'd like Buffalo to make it back to the Super Bowl again, John. Excuse me. Yeah, <laughs> I, I do too. And, uh, and Tom Zach's done an excellent job starting the second game for the Steelers. He seems to have uh, stabilized that offense. Duke coming with the blitz. Bates open, pulls it in at the 20-yard line. And Steve Snur got planted, I mean planted like carrots, at the 38-yard line by Darius Clark, who was blitzing. Uh, it, there's nothing a quarterback can do to earn the respect of his teammates than to hang in there in the face of a blitz. Watch Darius Clark, number 13. you got to hang in there and take that hit right in the solar plexus. And, of course, Bates has the one-on-one -on -one coverage on Ken and Holly, and he's able to use the whole field because it's blitz coverage. There's no safety there. Hey, he's in the quarterback's throat. But that, uh, you want to win the admiration of your teammates. Linemen love that. Who says quarterbacks aren't tough guys, huh? Bates now with three receptions, total of 61 yards. Autry dancing. No room on the dance floor. No parking on the dance floor. Thank you very much. Brought down at the 20 by Granville and Brian McCormick. 52 and 99, respectively. It'll be second down and about 11 to go. And the last two times Duke has been able to hold on first down, the key to their defensive strategy is Northwestern is basically a conservative offense. A lot of what they do is predicated on getting good yardage on first down, and Schnur's been perfect so far today. But second down and long, now Duke can dictate some things defensively. John, this Northwestern team looks a lot better early than they did a week ago. And won't <laughs> yeah. see that happen often. I think they just got the jinx from you a got on high. Bates dropped it. Guy had a perfect day. Look at the way you ruined this perfect day. <laughs> I'm Mark Jones, along with John Spagnola and Dean Blevins down at the sidelines. Gary Barnett's Northwestern Wildcats leading Duke 6 to nothing. They scored on their opening drive of the ball game, but missed the extra point. Darnell Autry scored on a 30-yard touchdown run where he broke a couple of tackles. And I think you said, you know, Northwestern looks that much better today. 
generally in football and college football, I say your most uh, improvement comes between the first and second week of the season. Third down and 10. Schnurl steps back and wants to talk it over with the coaches on the sideline. The defending Big Ten champs leading 6 0 when we return to Durham. Stay with us. Duke with 2.14 remaining in the opening frame. Dwayne Bates split wide to the bottom of your screen. Brian Musso in motion to the top. Schnurr is going to pass, looking for his tight end, and he goes over the middle underneath, complete at the 18-yard line. Billy Granville making the stop on Tucson Waterman, and it's not enough for a first down, so in comes the field goal unit, led by Brown, Brian Goins. Well, they tried a high-low option. They realized with third and 10, Northwestern felt the Duke linebackers would drop deep, but uh, Billy Granville would have none of that. Gowans has a career long of 50 yards. This one coming from 33 yards out. It was a perfect two for two last week, but missed the extra point early in the game. This time, drills it right through the uprights. And Northwestern takes a nine to nothing lead with 135 remaining in the first period. Well, tomorrow night on ABC starts with an hour of America's Funniest Home Videos. Then Sandra Bullock, Demi Moore, and Courtney Love guest on the Barbara Walters special. And Denzel Washington and Emmy winner John Lithgow star in the Sunday night movie Ricochet, all tomorrow night on ABC. Great scene in that movie when Denzel uh, shoots the guy behind the back with that hidden pistol. One of my favorites, John. I, I, you know what? <laughs> I won't miss it. You make sure you call me to remind me. Oh, why. I will. Okay. <laughs> Perfect afternoon for college football here in Durham, North Carolina. Part of the research triangle. Coming to you from the state that gave us three presidents. Goins kicking off and back deep. Cedric Tate and Richmond Flowers. Duke with an impressive drive, which was stopped in the end zone with an interception by Northwestern. Gonna get another chance here. This is Tate. Tate is drilled, and he put it on the ground. Who's got it? I think it was alertly covered up by his teammate. At least the Duke player had the first chance to get to it. What a hit that time, though. This Northwestern team is really fired up. Duke recovered the fumble. Center Tate works on the right side of the field. He doesn't have a lot of help immediately and somebody gets right through a great hit on the football that was 34 Lavelle Brown it hits the hook football but there is an alert player looks like 45 jumped on top of it Jim Kovac and boy <laughs> the thing barely worked its way under his arms there at the very end so alertly he jumps on the ball but that's not a great way to start out and Raider has poor field position to work from Raider in at quarterback after an impressive opening drive. Quick three-step drop. Complete to Thomas. Oh, boy. A little rough play after the catch. Thomas pushed out of bounds at the 19-yard line. It's rough. And Dean Blevins, what's up with the injuries downstairs? Well, a couple for Northwestern. Chad Pugh, the guard you saw a moment ago, number 77, is out. Ice is being applied to his knee. Doctors tell me it's twisted. They'll take a look at it a little bit later. Hopefully, he will be able to return, but it's questionable at this point. Earlier, tight end, number 83, Darren Drexler, rolled an ankle. He already has returned, though. Our good news, they cannot afford to lose Drexler. He's a key part of that offensive line. Good receiver as well. Four wide receivers out for Duke once again. Another quick three-step drop. Complete again out to the 28-yard line. And a first down, Barry Gardner. You know, Hudefa is mainly did not play last week. He was suspended for breaking team rules. That definitely hurt this team. Look how aggressive he is defensively. Corey Thomas caught the ball in front of him before and got hit out of bounds. This time he said, this corner's aggressive. I'm going to give him something and take it away, and he did. Fortunately, the pursuit uh, didn't allow him to get any further downfield, but uh, Ismaili returned that first kickoff, and I think he's got a bit of an attitude. He's trying to put two games into one here this afternoon. If you're a DB, you have to have attitude. They run at that time. That was Marshall up the middle. 
out to the 29-yard line on first and 10. Ray Roby, number 96, along with Barry Gardner, 55, making the tackle that time for Northwestern. It'll be second down and nine to go. Fred Goldsmith in his third year here at Duke. Trying to build a program of national prominence to join the basketball team, which has enjoyed a lot of success here. Marshall DeLone back. Second down and nine. Raider to throw again. And it's ruled complete at the 30. No, now incomplete. The official ruling out of bounds and is Maley in on the coverage again. Dominique Fleming, number 16, is working again this mail. I mean, look how aggressive this guy is. He closes to the football quickly. Let's see uh, that his left foot was definitely on the white stripe, so it was an accurate call. But again, with, when his mail, he hits you on the sidelines. If you're on the sideline, you better back up. He, you're going to go at least 10 yards outside of the sideline. Is Maley a pro prospect? He's their nickel back, too, and considered their best cover guy in the secondary. He's very effective in that nickel package. Right here is where he's most effective. Third down and nine to go for Duke. Blitz coming, but it's picked up. Rare, though, goes down, and he may have fumbled it. He did, and Northwestern has the ball at the 20. If Joe Reef did, that is one of the most alert plays you'll ever see. Joe Reef on the ground, gets the sack, and is able to strip Matt Rader. Watch Joe Reef, 94. Work his way in. Now, Raider has some time, but slips on the drop back. Right there, he's down on the ground, and yeah, Reef just pulls it out and takes the ball. A very alert play, and I'm sure Raider was saying, hey, my forward progress was stopped, or any number of things he could come up with, but. And again, a turnover, the second turnover of the afternoon for Duke, much to the chagrin of head coach Fred Goldsmith. And Reef, number 94, would be dangerous in a subway. Keep your eye on your wall. He just picked his pocket. Adrian Autry now in, number 32 in the backfield. No relation to Darnell. Schnur has time into the end zone. Tried to find Darren Drexler, the tight end, who was shaken up, but now back in the game, as Dean pointed out. Darius Clark, number 13, in on the coverage. It'll be second down and 10 now for Northwestern. This is your typical Northwestern type of game, though. Last year, they were third in the country in turnovers, positive 1.82 today, uh, last year. And today, they've already had uh, two takeaways by their defense, and they enjoy some terrific field position as a result of that. So Barnett's got to be pleased with the way the game's going so far. 9-0. Leading. Adrian Autry over the right side, not finding much room. Maybe got two yards on the play. Scanian making the tackle that time, number 91. Seven, seven seconds remaining in the first period. Northwestern doing very well in the first quarter a year ago, trying to continue that trend with a 9-0 lead so far. We'll be back with the second quarter after this. Back in Wade Stadium for the beginning of the second quarter. First quarter numbers, when you look at them, you go to the bottom and you see two, two turnovers for Duke and none for Northwestern. That underscores the score on the board right now. That's the story of this game so far. Surprisingly, uh, the Wildcats are throwing for more yards than they're rushing for. But uh, the two turnovers have been very costly for Duke. Third down and nine to go now for Northwestern. Sure, the quarterback. The pitch inside to Lavelle Brown. And Brown is stopped up short of the first down. But they do move the ball into the middle of the field at the 13-yard line. Now you got to wonder what kind of message this sends. Two third down situations, third and 10 on a previous drive, third and 10 here. And both times, Barnett goes with a very conservative pass underneath. This was a little shovel pass. Remember, they threw to the tight end before. you got to wonder, you know, perhaps why they're not trying to open it up. And, you know, certainly they don't want to make mistakes, and they'll take the three points here. But it might send a message to the offense that they're trying to be a little more conservative, too. Gowan's in for the field goal, coming from 30 yards out. Out of the hold of Hamdor. 
And he is two for two in the field goal department this afternoon. Four for four on the season. 12 nothing when we come back. The goal to give Northwestern a 12 to nothing lead. Just underway here in the second quarter in Durham, North Carolina. Northwestern kicking on. Tate and Flowers back deep. That is Tate, who got rocked on the last kickoff return. This time, goes down on his own. Well, this is Northwestern's second week down here in North Carolina. And last week, John, they were ambushed against Wake Forest. Yeah, they took a 28-13 lead, but this is the winning play. Brian Kuklik to Desmond Clark right there in front of Fred Wilkerson for the touchdown. Just shocked Northwestern fans, and they realized they weren't ready to play in that football game and that they are not that talented where they can just show up and people are going to quake at the sight in the name of Northwestern. Yeah, Pat Fitzgerald, number 51 of Northwestern, the middle linebacker, the All-American, guaranteed that things would be different today. He guaranteed they would play as a team be a lot more intense and Wagner Raider completes the pass out to the 33 yard line to Gerald Ford the tight end brought down by Tim Sharp Ford a six foot four inch 230 pound senior John they say he's more of an H-back type yeah the uh, you know he doesn't really have the size you find in most tight ends anymore today, but uh, I think he just does a great job. I mean, the fact that he plays better in games than he does in practice is the kind of guy you can depend on, and they have some good tight ends behind him, too. A 16-yard pickup, first down and 10 for Duke. Duke has been stung by two turnovers. Marshall this time over the right tackle, running over Austin Smithwick, the freshman. Picking up two yards, it'll be second down and eight. Matt Rice making the tackle. See, Pat Fitzgerald is so good at reading his keys. I was talking to a scout before the game today. He said he reminded him of Zach Thomas, the guy, the rookie's doing so well for Miami. Reading his keys, seeing alignments, understanding formations. That all gives you a sense of, you know, you work out the probabilities in your head as to where things are going to go, and you get there a little bit sooner, and that's what he does so well. Later, throwing complete into traffic at the 46-yard line. And let's go back to John Saunders for an update on those Huskies, John. Margaret facing BYU this afternoon. Rashawn Sheehy, who struggled last week, is off and running this week already with one touchdown. Sheehy here takes it around the left side, cuts it back, breaks a tackle, 45 yards, 14-0 at the end of the first quarter. Back to you, Mark. Well, yeah, the Pac-10 race is going to be interesting this year. It sure will. It's always a balanced conference. A little counter. That was Marshall again, who prior to that attempt had run the ball seven times for a total of 22 yards this afternoon. Marshall out of Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Look at Chad Pugh on the sidelines, icing that left knee. Twisted knee. Boy, that's a horrible feeling. You just, you, all of a sudden, the strength is completely zapped out of that joint when you twist it. And you can see he's trying to keep some mobility in there as he ices it down. They weren't built for, built for sports, were they? Those knees, no. <laughs> they didn't have football in mind a long time ago. Trips right formation this time, and now... Owens in motion. Little waggle. Raider almost picked up and almost caught by Corey Thomas. Two different players had their hands on the ball that time, and it's incomplete. Yeah, that ball drifted a little bit too far downfield. See number 33, Collier, make a break on the football, and he says, oh, my gosh, it's coming right to me. It goes right through him, and as you said, Mark Thomas was right behind it and almost made the catch himself. But that's where that's where quarterback uh, and, a, and a strong safety read the tendencies. Raider 8 for 12 for 89. Schnur having a very good day so far. Third and Collier read that play and made the jump on the ball early. Good numbers by both quarterbacks. Third down and six now for the Blue Devils. Under pressure, Raider steps up. He's got to get six. He's brought down to the 43 right near that first down marker. And it looks like he may have it. Tor Schmidt. Oh. Oh. Making the tackle. Oh. Man, did he step up and make a play. First down, Duke. Well, you got to have a little smarts to get out of a play like this. 
A lot of pressure on the outside. He pulls it down right away and realizes he's going to have too much pressure. And he knows where the first down markers are. It's the second time he's done that today. You know he graduated number one in his class at Fairless Hills High School in Yardley. So he's no dummy. Economics major, wants to go off and get an MBA. his shoulder down and makes it down to the 17 yard line finally pushed out by his mailing hey what's marshall trying to do that dipsy doodle stuff in the open field little high come stuff. on laymar <laughs> that's not you a 26 yard pickup nonetheless i'm so impressed with matt raider pressure all over him comes out of the play action it's a bootleg where he's going to fake go the other way and how he knows Lamar Marshall is there and gets the ball to him the way he did is amazing to me. Now watch Lamar and I say, hey, I'm in the open field. Check this out. Woo! Nobody moved. <laughs> when a power back does that in the open field, you just keep closing on him and closing on him, making the tackle. Ball at the 17-yard line, first and 10. They use the waggle again. Raider has time. Fires complete at the three-yard line. To Hodrick. Tight, groping his way down the sidelines. And now they mark it at the five. Well, if you're a quarterback and you're scrambling, the one thing you love to throw to is a former quarterback, and that's what Jeff Hodrick was in high school. They play that little scramble drill. And Hodrick does a good job of tight roping the sidelines. Right there, he gets his feet in. Yeah, definitely has his feet in. But he finds the open area. If it's Gerald in coverage, the ball slips in there. He shuffles those feet just before they go out of bounds. So a good alert play by two quarterbacks, one a former one. Those look in motion this time. They give it to Marshall, who runs straight into the pile, led by Matt Rice. And I hear here's where the Wildcat defense was good in the first quarter. Ball inside their territory, and they got the turnover. And here's where defensive teams pull together and tighten up. It is second down and six to go. This is a defense that lost seven starters from last year. So this is where the concern is, especially in the secondary for Gary Barnett. Wilson split wide. Into the end zone. Touchdown, Duke. Patrick. Tried to get the ball to Hodrick before, and it was intercepted. This time they find him. The waggles and play actions have been very effective so far, and you'll see number nine settle right in the middle of your screen saying, give it to me, give it to me. Hey, not that high, but I'll take it. He was waiting for what seemed a long one. time, I'm sure. And Sims Linhart in for the extra point. And it's good. So Duke serving notice that they're here, they're here to play. Now trailing just 12 to 7. Lighting a fire, putting a little giddy up in the gallop of Fred Goldsmith. We'll be back right after this. Here, Raider takes the ball, play action, come back this way. Hodrick is going to work downfield and just settle. And it's a well-designed play. I'm very impressed with the job Raider's doing with his play action fakes. You can see the whole Northwestern defense bite on that. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh. Hey, John, guess who's laughing now? <laughs> That's not my voice. That's the voice you're getting ready for Halloween right there. <laughs> Sound like Vincent Price. <laughs> Duke coming alive with 10.42 remaining in the first half, trailing 12 to 7. That was Raiders' first career touchdown pass. And this is Ismaili returning the kickoff. Ismaili's still on his feet, going down finally at the 35-yard line. A big showdown between the Big Ten and the Big 12, Michigan and Colorado. John Saunders in New York. Thanks, Mark. After they traded fumbles, Colorado gets the ball back on the eight. Lendon Henry takes it in, and Colorado has their first score of the game, 7-3. Michigan with the ball right now. Mark, back to you. Michigan with a very difficult schedule this year. They... Uh, 
play UCLA in a couple of weeks. Game we'll see on ABC. Flags down on the play. You know, as I talked about before, Northwestern is not a team that necessarily dominates all the time. They play steady offense and defense. Got a false start there. And you can see last year, you know, even with the 10-1 and record mark, opponents actually outgained them during the course of the year. But the key difference there is that turnover ratio, almost two turnovers plus a game. And misleading statistics right there. 10.35 remaining in the first half. Autry, the lone back for Northwestern. He gets the call. And the D train is stopped up in the station. Brought down right at the line of scrimmage. The Duke defense, this young group, really fired up now. Billy Granville making the tackle. And Chike and Budaway helped him out. Two tough guys in the middle. It looks like they're both getting signals from the coach. <laughs> Maybe Granville wants to make sure that Abunaway is saying the right thing. <laughs> Abunaway, one of two returning starters on that Duke Blue Devil defense. Second down and 14. They come with the blitz. Bates over the middle, incomplete. And Schnur got dropped and dropped hard. Holly was in on the coverage. Lance McQueen, number one, comes on the outside. Archie does a good job of picking him up, but that's Curtis Bunch, number 95, that lays the lumber to Mr. Schnur. Gives a little hug at the end. It's funny how they both try and look to see where the ball goes. Isn't that when they get down on the ground like that? <laughs> they don't have the best seat in the house, believe me. No, you don't want to be on your back like that. Third down and 14 to go. Duke with a new sense of vitality. Schnur has a ton of time. Gets it away. And he's picked off. Darius Clark at the 40-yard line. Schnur tried to force it into Bates, but it wasn't meant to be that time. Yeah, Schnur, Schnur's not real happy. If there's one criticism I saw from last week against Wake Forest, is that he doesn't look off the defenders. He tends to eyeball the person he's going to. There, as you mentioned, Mark, with all the time he had, he's eyeballing Bates all the way across the field. Now you see Bates cut across. Just hold it right there a second. Bates is going to be coming across here right now. And as he works to the left side, Schnur's going to keep looking and looking and looking and finally fires it. And look at that. There's Clark. He just breaks on the football that much more quickly than Bates can. Bates could have helped his quarterback by coming back to the football. Raider over the middle, complete to Rico Owens. Down to the 30-yard line. They mark it now at the 31, maybe a yard shy of the first down. Northwestern with its first turnover of the day compared to two for Duke. Last week, they had four, which resulted in 10 points for their opponents, Wake Forest. And that was right at the beginning of the game. They Musso fumbled a punt, and then Schnur threw an interception, and they got down early in that game. And, you know, one thing that helped Wake Forest last week is they had played a game not only a week before, but about 10 days before against Appalachian yeah. State. There's Marshall with the first down and then some down to the 22-yard line. Mike Nelson making the tackle. This Duke team really coming together. Yeah. Team is a big part of their vocabulary. That's 69 right there. Gannon Shepard, he's 6'8", 255. He played center on his high school championship uh, basketball team. Marist High School in Norcross, Georgia, but no name on the back of the jersey. Duke promoting team unity. Raider intended for Rico Owens, incomplete. For more on the no-name gang, Dean Blevins. You know, John mentioned the no-names on the jerseys, and Fred Goldsmith wanted his team to be unified more. We see this oftentimes around the country, but it's working here at Duke. Some traditional teams, USC, Notre Dame, and Penn State, some others have never had names on it, but this club is one that feels it's pulling together more by the show of play today. Maybe it's working. Well, they're coming back right now, Dean. I like that concept, not as an announcer, but as a player. You know, they just strip the name off anyway and put another name on when you leave. <laughs> Trips left formation, Raider to pass. Steps up, lunging forward to the 19. 
They'll be about seven yards short of the first down. Casey Daly making the tackle. It'll be third down, about seven to go for Duke, with 8.42 remaining in the first half of play. Duke trailing 12 to seven. Daly's a good pass rusher. They like him on the edge, and he's got good quickness. That's a trend you see now in college football, smaller ends, isn't it, John? Yeah, you sure do, or quicker. They want people coming off the edge of the defense to exert pressure on the quarterback. A critical third and seven for Duke. Marshall in the backfield. Raider to pass under pressure. Incomplete at the 15. It wouldn't have been enough for the first down. Rico Owens didn't get far enough, and he didn't catch it, so in comes the field goal unit. Well, you know, Raider didn't convert the first down, but I like the way he found his uh, third receiver there. He was looking downfield. Everybody was covered. He, he didn't want to force the football here. He's going to get some points if he can from his field goal team. So it's smart decision-making by him. Making his first start, and they haven't taken out anything out of the offensive package for him. He's a smart guy who can handle the load. Sims Lenhart in for the field goal attempt. For his first career field goal attempt. Northwestern snuffs it, and it's out of bounds at the 22-yard line. Yeah, I think uh, Kyle, Kyle Sanders, Sanders, number yep. 31, came in and smothered it in a big way. Kyle Sanders came in from the outside. Got his hands on that football. And Northwestern, after turning it over, comes back and makes a big play. They still lead 12 to 7. What kind of pizza this is? Well, two, two bad things on this play. Sims Lenhart, first of all, get some socks, young man. You got on a football team here. <laughs> and then secondly, Kyle Sanders comes right between the tight end and the guard. Roll a little bit more. Now stop it. Stop it right there. 31 comes right through this gap right here and gets a bead right on the football. Go ahead and roll it. And there you see the block. So good job by the Wildcats spotting something in the blocking scheme of that field goal team. At first, from a far vantage point, it appeared that it was a low kick, but well, there's not a lot of pressure. No. Now he got that right between the wing and the tight end, and Kyle Sanders did a great job of going through there. Back up free safety. Kick never had a chance. First down and 10. Nose of the ball to 22 for Northwestern. Has a seat. Autry breaking away. Still on his feet. Darnell Autry over midfield and down to the 46-yard line. Tackled finally by Holly. A 32-yard pickup for the All-American candidate. That's that zone running play again. This is the staple of the offense for Northwestern coming right at you. Now Autry starts this way and he gets to pick his spot. See how patient he is? And look how everything is just balled inside by the linemen. That's, that's what the great backs do. They're patient, they wait for the seam, they have confidence in their line, and then they burst. And that's just what he did. Autry with some impressive numbers this afternoon. 7.6 yards per carry. Autry, the theater major, providing a little drama on that last play, this time running it down to the 41-yard line. That was Adrian Autry, no relation. There's our actor slash football player slash student athlete. And anything else you might want to add? He's just good and tough. I'll stay with the football description. I'll <laughs> let you handle the thespian stuff, okay? <laughs> might be winning an Oscar someday. Charlton Heston went to Northwestern, didn't he? And Margaret did. Robert Redford did, among others. 7-18 remaining in the first half. 12-7 Northwestern on second and four. Nice run that time by the other Autry, Adrian Autry. No relation. Wambi settles the free safety making the tackle. They may not be related, but they're very similar as they pass the baton to one another. There's Adrian, 5'10", 194 pounds. Coaches feel he's a nice compliment, John, to Adrian. Pardon me, to Darnell. But yeah, he's a little quicker. A little different, more of a slasher, but the average yards per rush at 6.4 is exactly what Gary Barnett needed in the second game of the season. And the two, the block field goal and the turnover in the end zone deep in their territory. There's Darnell. First and 10, running it down to the 29-yard line, brought down by Darius Clark, number 13. Autry, a very durable guy, 
As I mentioned, 210 pounds. Did a lot of weightlifting this past summer, as well as some uh, movie making. Well, you know, he says they, they, they say he has a tremendous work ethic. He's a guy who practices very hard and plays even that much harder. And it's hard as a teammate when you have your star player working that hard. Jerry Rice is a guy, I think, that leads by example in the NFL in a very similar way. Hard to slough off. Second down and seven. Goes high into the air to make the catch at the 25-yard line. Holly there on the coverage. That ball might have been tipped on its way out to Bates. I think it was. He'll set up third down. You know, Bates is another guy who's a converted quarterback. Chris Ruzik probably got his big paw on the ball, but didn't uh, misdirect it enough to keep it away from Bates. Third down and three to go. Brian Musso split wide to the top of your screen. Bates to the bottom of your screen. Autry, the lone back. And they're going to throw. Stir has Musso complete for the first down at the 17-yard line. A nice little hook that time. Musso sitting down and making the catch. Desi Thomas making the stop. Next Saturday on ABC Sports, our college football doubleheader begins at noon Eastern when ninth-ranked Notre Dame takes on number seven, Texas. Then at 3.30 Eastern, Georgia Tech battles number 12, North Carolina. BC meets Michigan or other regional action. Don't forget to call your cable operator. The game's available in your area. 5.15 remaining in the first half. First down and 10 for Northwestern, who leads 12-7. to seven. with a little counter step. Trying the left side and gang tackled. That Duke defense on that play running nicely to the ball. Advance McQueen making the stop. McQueen, number one. You know, even though Archie doesn't gain anything on this play, you get a sense of the power. Counter step is a counter play that Duke defends well, but this is where the power comes from from this young man, and he's got those quick feet. Of course, nothing's happening in front of him, but he's not afraid to just stick it up in there and drive as well as he can. And, of course, he has the speed. We see the patience that he had on that long 32-yard run. Yeah, the two times that he's been timed in the 40s, run 4-4-1 and 4-4-5. And number 24 this time, running down to the 15. Autry again. It'll set up third down and long for Northwestern. Scanian making the tackle that time along with Billy Granville. Reminder, at the conclusion of today's game, we'll select a genuine Chevrolet most valuable player of the game from each team. To date, Chevrolet has awarded nearly $6 million to the scholarship funds of America's colleges and universities. Third down and nine. Autry in the backfield. Three receivers out. Brian Musso in motion. Schnur from Musso open. Nice sidestep. Still on his feet. Touchdown, Northwestern. Brian Musso doing a little dance and making it into the house. 15 yards, a sweet run by Musso. You know, Greg Meyer, the offensive coordinator, told us that he challenged his receivers to catch the short passes and make big runs out of it. That's what they want to do in this passing game at Northwestern. And I can't think of a better example than what we just saw from Brian Musso. Brian Musso, the son of the former Alabama star and Chicago Bear star, Johnny Musso. With a nice run. Gowans now on for the extra point. And they fumble it. Could be a two-pointer. Who can convert it if they can keep going? And they just might, folks. I saw Ray Farmer do this last year against Florida State. And here comes McQueen. McQueen running it like a king. A royal run into the end zone. Two points for Duke on that play. You can't sleep on those extra points. So Northwestern running the full gamut of emotions in two plays. Yeah, here's Brian Musso, number 22. He's just going to catch a simple flat pattern, watch him work back inside, stays under his feet. He's a kickoff returner, so he's used to running in the open field. Now the snap comes back. Goes right through the hands of Hamdorf, the holder, number four. And there goes LeVance McQueen. That's a long run, isn't it? Sure it is. that's, that's two points, and he's willing to do it. 
Oh boy, oh boy, things turn quickly in football, don't they? <laughs> McQueen just recently had a bull tattoo put on his arm. Well, he ran like a bull, him. didn't he? He was <laughs> snorting all the way down. Somebody had to wave a red flag in the end zone to get him there. Looked like he was riding a bull or running with the bulls in Pamplona. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's waiting for his teammates to gore him. Oh, boy. They still haven't tacked the two points on the scoreboard. 340 remaining in the first half. Well, that's interesting. They might have blown the whistle down. I saw they had 18 to 9 on the scoreboard. Now it's 18 7. And there's our Dean Blevins getting the official word from the official. He never had possession, therefore he can't fumble. Okay. It's a wow. pass, then who's going to fix it up? I got you. All right, I just talked to the official. He said it's a backward pass, therefore it's a fumble at that point, and no one can pick that up and advance it. That was a backwards pass from the snap. So that is a call, unpopular one Ryan here at Duke. But that is correct. For the Wildcats. Well, it's a real technical interpretation of the rule. And that is a lateral or backwards pass cannot be advanced, but that doesn't seem to fit under the description of a lateral. The grounded and backwards passes cannot be advanced. Cedric Tate on the return. You know, that's one you can't pull in front of these Duke students, though. They're too sharp to fall for that. I bet they're all in the rule book right now trying to figure out a, a loophole there. Yeah, these are students that can split atoms. <laughs> There's a look at the student body here that has shown up at Wallace Wade Stadium this afternoon. A perfect backdrop for a football game. 18-7, to Northwestern leading with 3.34 remaining in the first half. Had to put down their... Uh, calculus books to see what happened on that one. Yeah, the highlighters. They put the caps back on the highlighters, didn't they? <laughs> Trips left formation this time. Duke with the ball incomplete. Intended for Dominique Fleming, number 16. It'll be second down and 10 for Matt Rader. Tomorrow at 3 Eastern, 2 Central and Pacific on ABC Sports, Robbie Gordon and 11 of the world top drivers made in Michigan to take the final challenge of the International Race of Champions. Then at 4 Eastern, 3 Central and Pacific, Ari Leyendijk, the Dutchman, and one of my favorites, and the stars of the Indy Racing League roll the dice in the desert at the Las Vegas Motor Speedway. That's all tomorrow on ABC Sports. Three and a half minutes remaining in the first half. 18-7 Northwestern leading. Another short drop. This time the pass complete to Fleming. Makes it out to the 34. Let's go downstairs to Dean Blevins. Dean? Well, guys, the, the mood on the field is one that uh, switched actually when that call was made because I think the fans are back into it. So were the Duke players after presumably getting a couple of points. But right now, it's been very clear that Raider has played well. He needs to take this club down, get some points on the board, gain a little momentum. Or, guys, they're Northwestern's they're a club that feels they're like it's been in control, and I think that they would come out in the second half unless Duke does something here. That's a good point about Raider, you know, Dean. I would if I'm Fred Goldsmith, feel very, very good about the way that he's played here yeah. in the first half. Let's check in with John Saunders in New York. All right, Texas and John McAvoy trying to rebound after a disappointing finish to last season in the Sugar Bowl. They have some talent down there. Oh, they sure Ricky do. Williams, James Brown, the quarterback that McAvoy can move the football offensively. He's got some talent to do it with. How about that season in 95 for the Wildcats? I don't think anybody doesn't know that story anymore. 2.52 remaining in the first half. The pass complete to Thomas on the near sideline. Let's check in with John Saunders. Mark, Michigan and Colorado, a costly Colorado penalty kept its drive alive. And Clarence Williams, solid as he takes it across seven yards, 10-7 now, Michigan on top. Mark. Two of the top conferences in college football, the Big Ten and the Big 12. You know, Colorado State scored a lot of points last week against Colorado. I expected Michigan to be able to move the football. First and 10, Raider going deep. He tried to find Corey Thomas, number eight. Josh Barnes in on the coverage, and Raider getting up off the turf. 
Took another hit. Yeah, David Green is out. He was supposed to be the starter. Matt Rader took a pretty good lick on this play. Sets up and throws the ball deep. Right at the last second, Matt Rice, number 95, hits him right in that hip area. Raiders He's checking to make sure everything's still connected. <laughs> Raiders been very poised this afternoon. 14 of 22. Total of 157 yards. Hands it off this time to his back, who smothered at the 36-yard line, Lamar Marshall, the 210-pound junior. And I expected this. The Wildcats are calling timeout. It's third down and long. Two minutes, 32 seconds left now. They want to see if they can get a stop here on third down and execute their two-minute offense. Gary Barnett now becoming a curator of the clock. And coming up tonight, Bulldog running back Robert Edwards tries to run circles around the Gamecock defense. It's a showdown in the SEC as Georgia takes on South Carolina tonight at 7.30 p.m. Eastern time only on ESPN. And look at the injured quarterback, David Green, was shaken up last week against Florida State. He's got a cast on his left ankle. You can see it right there. It's a soft cast, splint. And I saw him before the game, and I know Dean Blevins did, and he's trying to keep the thing loose. But uh, there, he just looks so ginger dropping back, he could never really do it full speed. So those ankle injuries are tough for quarterbacks because so much is required of their footwork. Difficult for him in that he was a backup his first three seasons. And played three games last year, completing yeah. just four passes. But you wait so long for your opportunity, and then it never comes because of something unfortunate as an injury. But part of the game, as they like to say. Yep. Spence Fisher started 38 games here, a very good quarterback. And he waited his turn like so many quarterbacks, too. And, you know, opportunity only knocks so, so long for you. Hopefully he can heal up. It is third down and 12. Five. Count them five wide receivers. Out on the play for Duke. Raider complete in traffic at the 49-yard line to Hodrick. Picked up 13, and it's a first down. Boy, was he cool under pressure. You know, it's interesting about this play is how close these two receivers were. These are the two receivers. There's three on the other side of the field. They just hook up together. But, I mean, they're dangerously close to one another. I'm surprised that uh, there's not a little more separation between the two of them. Corey Thomas making the catch. Some teams, John, like to run those bunch patterns. You didn't think that was one, though, huh? Well, you bunch more in the middle of the field and then separate away. You don't do that on the, toward the sideline. You just draw people, and it's a longer throw. First down and 10, nonetheless, out of the field complete. And run out of bounds at the 44-yard line is number 25, Matt Diorio. His first play of the afternoon, Fred Goldsmith with 159 remaining in the first half. Trying to put some more points on the board. His team trailing 18 to 7. The starting quarterback today, Matt Rader, doing a fine job so far. And had that one critical interception early in the first quarter on their opening drive in the end zone. And the strip by Joe Reef, which hurt them. Single back set. Four wideouts. They bring the blitz this time. And it's picked up. Out of bounds at the 35-yard line. Boy, Matt Rader has a feel for what's happening on the field. Corey Thomas made the catch. Is mainly on the tackle. Top of the screen, I'm sorry, hold it right there. You see the receiver working outside. Great throw by Raider, and what really, really impresses me is that he has dispersed the football to eight different receivers today. Corey Thomas, number eight, is the eighth guy, and he has six catches for 56 yards, so he's doing a very good job of distributing the football. Little play fake, they like this waggle, and it works again. Rico Owens down to the 24-yard line. And close to another first down. A pickup of 11 on the play. And they move the chains again. The clock stops with 147 now remaining in the first half. Tim Sharp making the tackle for Northwestern. Okay, that's a timeout against Duke. So they have one timeout remaining. But keep in mind, they took advantage of the Northwestern timeout to convert that third down earlier in this drive. 
This is such a young, young Duke squad, and Fred Goldsmith has the responsibility of grooming them for the future. And Fred Goldsmith talked about We his came into different situations. When I came into Duke, we had 50-year seniors who had been recruited after a bowl season. Duke won the ACC in 1989. Those guys were available. Some of them had been hurt. Some of them had been ineligible the year before. I had a nucleus of good players that first year. We said, we've got to win now. That made the recruiting efforts really super the last two years based on what we did in 1994, winning eight games, losing two others by one point. So then all of a sudden now we have a lot of young players that are getting pushed into action. That recruiting season he was talking about with Steve Spurrier's last season here in 89 where he brought in that class and he inherited those seniors in 84. There's the timeouts remaining, but look how young this Blue Devil team is. You can see right there, 65 of the players on this squad are freshmen or sophomores, but 15 of the 22 starters are also freshmen and sophomores. So they're playing football. It's not like they're sitting on the bench watching. Watching, there's a lot of true freshmen, redshirt freshmen and sophomores that are playing a critical part of their success in this game. And Goldsmith with great recruiting ties in the state of Florida, which has been critical to their success. Little play fake again, this time Northwestern waiting for it. The pass complete nonetheless to Hodrick again, who's been valuable on offense for Duke. Brought down by Ismaili at the 19-yard line. Excellent job of getting rid of the football. Matt Rader right there executes his play action, locates his receiver quickly and gets rid of the football. Keith Lozowski is more than happy to put him on the ground, but uh, the Wildcats are getting wise to this waggle play. Thomas split to the top of your screen. Radar, the quarterback draw. Falls forward to the 14-yard line right near the first down marker. Brought down by Casey Daly with 1.05 remaining now in the first half. And that may be a situation where the Blue Devils realize the Wildcats are so concerned about the Waggles that they're ex exerting pressure on the outside and they ran that quick draw at the middle with the quarterback. This time they give it to Marshall. Down to the seven yard line with 46 seconds to play in the first half. Is Maley with another tackle. Duke had the wins taken out of their collective sales earlier when they had that two points taken back on the extra point attempt by Northwestern. Now moving down the field. The 12th play of this drive coming up. 35 seconds remaining in the first half. The clock running. Raider to pass. On the out pattern, incomplete intended for Corey Thomas. That stops the clock with 23 seconds to play in the half. John, what do you do here now? Well, their previous attempts at touchdowns came off of play action plays. Remember the waggle to Hodrick, and then the, the one that was a play action was intercepted, also was intended for Hodrick. Both were off of play action. With 23 seconds here, it's harder to convince the defense for the Wildcats that you're going to play action and run the football. Now they do have a timeout left. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily think uh, against running a draw play right here or something that's a quick hitter up the middle. Call the timeout and work on third down. They might be able to catch this defense off guard. All right, one timeout remaining for Duke. Flags down. Not sure that oh they got boy. the playoff. If it's too much time, a delay a game. That's almost criminal prior to the snap delay of game Ooh. awesome i thought he was going to do that steve payment our official today and that is costly that's trying to make the perfect call a little bit of confusion a young quarterback trying to get the play in first duke penalty this afternoon too john four receivers out on this play they blitz incomplete over the middle flag down the pass intended for Hodrick. Collier in on the coverage, but he may have gotten there a little bit early. Well, that certainly helps the uh, Blue Devils because uh, gives them a first down, gets them back to about where they were before. 17 seconds to play in the half. 
Jeff Hodrick lines up just outside in the tight end position. He's going to work across here, and this is where Collier comes in and knocks the ball away. Now you see Collier closing on the football. And there's the contact, and the ball's not there yet, so it's definitely an accurate call. But it breathes new life into the Duke offense. Keep your eye on Hodrick, number nine. He's a favorite target of the quarterback, Matt Rader. On the wagon again. This time, they were waiting for it. Number 44, they got to get a timeout. Makes the sack with seven seconds to play. The clock running. Yeah, call and now it's out. finally stopped. Absolutely. Sorry, Mark. I'm getting a little excited here. <laughs> but you know that that that's what I was saying before. The waggles. You know that the play action doesn't work there. Not with that limited amount of time left. I think you just have to drop back and hope that you can get your four wide receivers set open in the end zone. Colorado takes the lead now on Michigan, 13 to 10 at the half. And in comes the field goal unit, led by Sims Lanhart, who had his last field goal attempt blocked. There's a breakdown in protection last time by Duke. We'll see if they have corrected that error. Six seconds to play in the first half. Actually, this is not the field goal blocking team. This is the defense. Northwestern is going to concede the field goal here and just play with their defense in case there's a fake. Lanhart from 32 yards out. Right down the middle. With two seconds remaining in the first half of play. So it wasn't a touchdown, but they'll take the three nonetheless. And I think that's part of the growing page you'll see with this offense. A little disorganization. Hey, how much has Matt Rader probably run a two-minute drill for this team? I mean, David Green's been doing it. He hasn't been getting the reps. But all in all, it was a good drive. They uh, converted some third downs and did an excellent job of at least getting some points out of this drive. When you have young players, John, you would think that early success in the first half or early confidence is so paramount and important to this team. It is, and that's why when Raider hit his first couple of passes in the game, and even uh, even though he threw the interception, you got the sense that he had control of the offense. He knew what was going on. And as you said, Mark, here's a guy who hasn't uh, had to back off on the offensive scheme at all. He's a very bright young man. Interesting that Duke against Florida State, the concern of the coaches was protection. This time, that young offensive line with the two freshman tackles has done a pretty good job so far. Yeah, they have. And when they grow into their frames, they'll be that much better. I mean, all of them, or both of them right now, can probably add another 40 pounds or so. There's your kicker, John. No socks. He's styling. <laughs> he squibs it. And at the 26-yard line is where the first half will end. Joel Stewart taking a knee. Northwestern having a better first half than they did last week against Wake Forest. Duke in this ballgame. They trail 18 to 10. John Saunders with a halftime report coming up. Class is not thermodynamics or nuclear physics. Today's class is football in the slide ruler bowl and Northwestern leads Duke 18 to 10. Mark Jones along with John Spagnola, Dean Blevins down on the sidelines. First half Really started off well for Northwestern. They scored a touchdown on their opening possession. And then Brian Musso took them into the end zone to make it 18 to 10 where we stand. Yeah, I think Northwestern's playing the kind of football they're very comfortable with, and that's the short passing game. Musso broke some tackles to get into the end zone. And this is the kind of thing that they like to do offensively, not take a lot of risks. You see Musso coming in motion, number 22. And he's a punt returner, kick returner. Watch the quickness here. One, two, three. Four or five different Duke defenders miss him on his way into the end zone. And then, John, on the ensuing extra point, a fumbled snap, and the ruling is that you cannot advance a fumbled snap for points. So at the time, we thought that LeVance McQueen here, number one, was running for two points, but that turned out not to be the case, much to the dismay of the Duke team. Dean Blevins spoke with Coach Gary Barnett just moments ago. Gary, some good, some bad. How do you evaluate the first half? Well, I thought we didn't tackle very well in the secondary, and that bootleg's got us all confused, and uh, we've got to just settle down and figure out a way to handle the boot. I think there at the end we did. And and then we got to be more consistent on offense. We're, not, we're just mushing the ball up in there, and it's just sluggish, I think. we got to get this thing going. Thanks, Coach. Good luck. All right, thank you. 
And it seemed as though at the end of the first half that they finally did figure out how to stop that waggle and that bootleg motion. That's right, Lozowski had the key stop against Matt Rader, and Duke was forced to go for the field goal. Northwestern, John, with six points off of turnovers so far. But Two that, Duke turnovers. Yeah, the total yardage is pretty close, 248 to 213. So Barnett knows he's in for a tough second half. This team traditionally plays very well in the third quarter. Duke receiving here in the second half. Got Montgomery, ball on the ground, and Northwestern says they have it, and they do. A very inauspicious beginning for Duke in the third quarter. Not a good beginning in the third quarter for the Blue Devils. Gowans, the kicker, recovering the fumble. And see that? They've only given up 17 points in the last 13 games in the third quarter. So that's a great start for the Wildcats in the second half. A fumbled kickoff. The kicker recovers it of all people. <laughs> Boy, does he look pleased with himself. Northwestern working with a short field right now. The ball in the 25-yard line. Darnell Autry. Who else? Looking for space. Can't find any. Run out of bounds right at the 25-yard line. You know, one thing about an experienced coaching staff, and Barnett's been in the business a long time, of course, with Bill McCartney. He came over from Colorado. But good teams make adjustments. You saw Barnett or heard him talk about the bootlegs killing us. we got to straighten that out. And this is a team, I don't think he's a guy that's a uh, fire and brimstone type guy that gives big speeches at halftime. But I do think he and his staff get together and make the kind of adjustments they need to make to get into the third quarter and to take command of football games. When you're dealing, as flags are thrown on the field, John, when you're dealing with seniors, a lot of seniors like Northwestern has, it makes the job a little easier. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and especially a team that's grown up together. Here's the call. Prior to the snap, false start. Offense, five-yard penalty, it's still second down. So they'll move it back to the 30-yard line. Fifteen yards to go for the first. Not the way that Fred Goldstein wanted to begin the second half of play. His young team coughing the ball up on the opening kickoff of the quarter. Autry the lone back. Toussaint Waterman split wide to the bottom of your screen. The official is trying to figure things out on the field. And we have a delay down on the field, and we'll try and figure things out. In the meantime, another look at that fumble on the kickoff. Yeah, Scotty Montgomery, who's normally not back there, it's usually Cedric Tate or Richmond Flowers, fields this. And this is a horrible way to begin the second half. That's, a, of course, if you're a Duke fan. He works his way upfield and cuts inside. It's just a really good hit. He does not secure the football. The inexperience will do that. I think the problem we have on the field, by the way, is the clock shows 14.48. It should be well under 15 minutes at this point. Go, Scanlon! That last hit, by the way, was made by Barry Gardner, number 55 for Northwestern, to cause the fumble. Second down and 15 for the Wildcats. Schnur to pass. Bates open and incomplete. Number 13, Darius Clark, coming over from a strong safety spot, knocked it loose. He really closed while the ball was in the air, too. Just a redshirt freshman closing. That ball hung up in the air just a little bit long. Bates had to wait underneath it. I think had it been thrown a little bit sooner with a little bit quicker tempo, that would have gotten there. Northwestern, a very productive team when leading at the half, at least in 95. This is 96, a different year, something that Gary Barnett has stressed to his team time and again, and flags down on the play. We have confirmation now that the delay we had earlier was because of the score clock here at the stadium. Steve Payman's a busy man. Another call. Prior to the snap, cross start, offense. 
Yeah, this could Five be a moral ability. victory. It's still third down. Third down, as Steve Payment said, but it's a it's got to be a moral victory here for the Duke defense if they do not have to give up any points. I mean, Wildcats get a great turnover to start the second half. They're in perfect position to score a touchdown or at least get a field goal. And now they're looking at what third and 20 yard line. Yeah, and John, that last penalty makes it third and 20, and more importantly, pushes Northwestern right to the edge, to the brink of Brian Gowans' field goal range. He has a career long of 50. So assuming they don't get any more yards, it would be his longest field goal attempt. It'd be about a 52 yarder. Nose of the ball at the 35. Northwestern and Duke, two teams coming in winless at 0-1. Northwestern being upset last week against Wake Forest, facing another ACC opponent today. The problem right now is the score clock. Third down and 20 for Northwestern. Schnur has time to Musa, and he got drilled at the 30. <laughs> Brian McCormick, number 99, put his helmet right between the two twos. Now, Brian Musso will realize you can do that dipsy doodle stuff on the sideline trying to get in the end zone. You start doing that stuff five yards downfield in the middle of the field, and you're going to have a whole lot of fellas closing in on you. <laughs> in comes Gowans now to attempt the field goal from 47 yards out. He has a strong leg, and there is a negligible win. about is fair play, I guess. Oh, man. Now each team has had a field goal attempt blocked, and Duke rises up with a big play. Seeing more blocked field goals and punts to start this season than in any season I can remember. Right up the middle is where the pressure comes. That's number six. Tawambi settles. The thing hits him right in the chest. Look how high he jumps in the air. Well, he better, next time he should cover his mouth, he took that thing almost in the teeth. He had a great athletic move, settles realizing it had to be a lower trajectory in order to go that far. Mike Krzyzewski put him in a pair of basketball sneakers. He can dunk it. We'll be right back. This is for Mr. Blanchard who told me to make something of myself. For Miss Miller, who never let me settle for a C. For my parents, who believe in my dreams. Watch Tawambi Settles number six come up and jump this high in the air. It's gonna be a lower trajectory kick because it's gotta go 40 some yards. But watch him just sky, and that hit him right in the face mask. <laughs> Tawambi putting his stamp on that last play. There's a look at Tawambi settles. I think Tawambi is Swahili for blocked field goal, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know. Or big play, anyway. Big play, sure. First down is 10, 13.57 remaining in the third quarter. Duke with the ball. And that is a swarming defense by Northwestern. Laymar Marshall stopped up right near the line of scrimmage. Pat Fitzgerald will have a lot to say about the outcome of this game. That's number 51 that you're looking at, along with Tim Sharp. Number 52, Fitzgerald had a great opportunity to visit with his family this morning at our hotel. Met his mother, his father, and his two sisters, as well as his girlfriend. You did the rounds, didn't you? Oh, you yeah. made the rounds. <laughs> well, you can see right there the difference in the attitude of this defense. Barnett alluded to that at halftime when he talked to Dean Blevins. His family said that Fitzgerald is just happy to be both playing. This one up for grabs, incomplete. Thrown dangerously down to the 40-yard line. It'll be third down and long. Speaking of families, Matt Rader, I asked him uh, if his parents were here at the game. He said, no, they're going to be watching at home. I said, well, I don't think it's in the Pennsylvania area. And he said, no, they're watching on pay-per-view. So he asked to say hello to his parents, David and Beth. I'm sure they're proud of his performance so far here today. And, you know, Duke has enjoyed very good field position as a result of that blocked field goal starting at midfield. So even if they don't convert here, they're going to force... Northwestern to drive the length of the field after a punt. Well, you'd think they're thinking about a first down right now and third down and 11. Five wideouts in for Raider, the quarterback at helm right now. And he fires incomplete at the 40-yard line intended for Corey Thomas. So after the blocked field goal, Duke unable to move the ball. 
Excellent secondary coverage downfield. Barnett was concerned about his secondary. He was asked in the offseason what he thought about his secondary. He said, when I think about my secondary, I sleep like a baby. I sleep for 15 minutes, and then I wake up crying. <laughs> and I think, you know, after the Wake Forest game last week, uh, he probably spent the week crying as well. John, interesting stat. This is the first punt of the game by either team. Brian Musso at the 18. And Musso tripped up at the 20-yard line. Nothing on the return. We'll be back. It's 18-10 when we return. Prestigious institutions of higher learning. This is Autry, a gaping hole up the middle. One man to beat, and Autry brought down at the 45-yard line. A picture of explosiveness by Darnell Autry. Great blocking right up the middle. You can see things open right up the middle real well. Great block by his fullback, McGrew, number 24. They're in the eye formation. They don't run this a whole lot, but it's an isolation play. Look at McGrew, 45, make a very good block. And there's Autry, ever so dangerous in the open field. Held on to the football and would not allow himself to get stripped. This is the other Autry with room on the left side of the line. Adrian Autry down to the 36-yard line. And that offensive line really firing off the ball for the Wildcats. Moyer making the tackle, number 28 for Duke. You know, Darnell Autry looked like he might have gotten a little banged up at the end of the play. He seemed to get up a little gingerly. That's twice today, John, that he's had to go to the sidelines after a big play, the first time being after that touchdown run. It'll be second down and one for Northwestern. The nose of the ball at the 36-yard line. On this, a special day in Durham at Duke University. A lot of special athletes, prestigious athletes, being honored. This is Adrian Autry for the first down. Speaking of special athletes, Dean Blevins is joined by a couple. Dean? You bet I am, and Duke people know who these guys are. This is Johnny Dawkins, of course, the all-time leading scorer in Duke basketball history, and Mike Jeminski. He broke his record in scoring all those points. These guys are the latest inductees into the Duke Hall of Fame. Big moment for you. I'm sure you're proud. Uh, definitely. It was an honor and a privilege, and I know I'm excited as well as uh, all the inductees. We're going to break for this play and come back, get caught up with what these guys are doing these days, and uh, they're doing quite well, by the way. As most Duke graduates do, Dean. This is Adrian Autry, still in the game for Darnell, down to the 32. That's where his forward progress will be marked, about six yards short of the first down. Back to Dean. Mike, you've been out for a couple of years. You're in the Charlotte area. Yeah, retired two years ago, Dean, and uh, took up the radio color analyst responsibilities for the Hornets, and this year we'll be doing some television as well. And I guess, Johnny Dawkins, you're looking to, to stay in the game as well. You've been out a year. Uh, yes, I have. I took a year off, uh, had another child, and decided I wanted to go into coaching. So uh, you have anybody with any ideas of where I can go, let me know. 1-800-JOHNNY. <laughs> One follow-up question after this play, guys. All right. Second down and eight. Johnny Dawkins with a good basketball mind. Make a good coach. This is is tackled at the 36-yard line. A nice hit by Clark. Back to Dean. And, guys, the, the question is, with Duke being an academic school, but basketball school as well, can football reach the level, or can it continue to gain in credibility? Uh, I believe so. Uh, you know, here at Duke, there, there aren't going to be any shortcuts, but uh, they can get it done. Uh, they've proven they could be successful, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it would happen sooner than later. Mike, you like the head coach. Fred Goldsmith is very impressive. He's done it at good academic schools before. I think he can do it here. All right, guys, thanks. Congratulations. Good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. That G-man knows those sound bites, doesn't he? He knows how to get his stuff in right before the play. He's done some color. He's a TV man already. <laughs> Third down and 11. They run to Austin. He has the first down to that side. Boy, does he add a lot to this team? I mean, he enters the game, and it's just a whole different dimension that this Wildcat offense takes. So Wambi settles, finally pushing him out at the 15-yard line, but a pickup of 21 yards on this scamper. Little draw play inside, Darnell, Darnell Autry takes it in, breaks it back outside, and here's what he's so good at, just staying on his feet, using his quickness to get outside, keeps those shoulders square the entire time. He's got the vision, all the things that you want out of a great running back. Darnell Autry with 142 yards now has 15 consecutive games played of gaining over 100 yards. Well, that's impressive. Especially with the schedule they play in the Big Ten. There he is again. Autry still on his feet down to the six-yard line. 
You know, he's also moved into second place all time behind Dennis Lundy now in Northwestern career. He started the game. He needed about 458 yards for first place. So he's making a run at the record books here at Northwestern. Only a junior, too. Now, if you're head coach Gary Barnett, you're hoping that number 24 sticks around one more year. Who knows? He might move into first at some point if he sticks around. We have an injured player on the field in the meanwhile. Number 91, Eric Scanian. One of the quicker players up front for Duke. Scanlon had a great game last week against Florida State. Played it, made a big play early in the game on a screen pass. Was very active in run support. And part of that defense that held Florida State to just 221 yards. Let's go downstairs to Dean. Well, guys, you know, Autry is a heck of an athlete. He's also a multi-talented guy, a very affable uh, guy with a wonderful personality. And take a look at some of this footage here. He's, he's a theater major. And this summer, he finally got clearance from the NCAA because he wasn't being paid to take part in a movie. Uh, 18th Angel over in Italy, and uh, let's listen in to, for his bit one big line. This one had a number on its back. Well, that is weird, like everything here. Yeah. Hold on. Um, do me a favor. Do we have a file on Michael Benedetti? Maybe in archives. Can we look for him? Thanks. <laughs> right, and here he is with one big run. Not quite down to the four-yard line. And afterwards, hey Spags, what do you think about this stuff now, huh? Oh, man, get rid of that. If you're, first of all, if you're in Italy, you don't want beer, you want some Chianti, and that thing, don't light that thing up, hey. Darnell. Come on. Classy guy, though, wouldn't he, guys? We spent a few minutes with him yesterday, and uh, he's a stud. Yeah, he certainly is. See if maybe he can get us a role in a movie sometime, John. Huh? Yeah, I'd be an extra in a movie and hang around with him. Big timing it in Italy. Well, you know, he's involved in a lot of plays there at Northwestern, too. He's a couple plays last year. He's auditioning for one this year, so he's he really wants to make a career of this. Right now, it's Darnell Autry playing Darnell Autry, the football player, brought down at the seven-yard line nicely by Settles. And that's Tawambi Settles playing defense. He's had some very terrific plays, has made his impact in the second half with the blocked field goal and just lining up from the free safety position. He just runs through, spots an opening. Might have actually been on a blitz and just turned the blitz toward the quarterback, toward the running back. But Tawambi Settles making some big plays here in the second half. Tenth play of the drive, second down and goal to go. Tucson Waterman split to the top of your screen, Bates to the bottom. Backs out of the offset eye. Schnurr with plenty of time into the end zone for Bates. Touchdown, Northwestern. He beat Keenan Hawley on the play. Bates got the feet down after going high. Mark, you'd asked me earlier about those bunch plays. That's what happened on that play. They tried to work a bunch play, bring everybody in. Hold it here a second. The players come in here, and then everybody starts dispersing in different directions. But Schnur goes all the way back to the opposite side of the field to throw the touchdown. See, he's looking right, and he realizes, okay, I got to go back across the grain. That's what he does, and alertly Bates is there to make the catch. In for the extra point. This one is not blocked like the prior one. Gowans nails it, and Northwestern with a 15-point bulge when we return. And a look at Big Ten action this afternoon. Colorado and Michigan nodded at 13 apiece in the third period. Look how much Notre Dame's improved in the second week. And look how much Penn State has improved on the scoreboard anyway, as opposed to last week against Louisville. Montgomery, two yards deep in the end zone. Was Schnur happy? What do you think after that last touchdown pass? <laughs> oh, he does feel good, doesn't he? Come up and call the Rambler real soon in this series. If we do, first of all, Steve JJ, Schnur, the you're senior up quarterback. The I got you. 39 Rambler. Hoping to lead his team back to the Rose Bowl in 1997. 1996 hasn't been all that good for head coach Gary Barnett in Northwestern. A couple of losses so far. Double 
pass incomplete inside. That's an incompletion intended for Rico Owens, not a fumble. That was interesting. They realized the Wildcats were going to very conscious about the play action or the bootleg, so they baited them and then tried to flip it underneath. Interesting play. And this is what they are playing for in the Big Ten. Right now, it is in Evanston, Illinois, the Big Ten Trophy. They got a hold of that for the first time since the 1930s. Gary Barnett hoping to make everyone forget about what happened in 1995. This is 1996. Pass tipped at the line of scrimmage, intended for number three, Owens, again. And it's incomplete. Somebody up front got a hand on it. And Pat Fitzgerald, number 51, is really getting his guys pumped up. He's the emotional leader of that defense. Middle linebacker. And I think Duke has to watch itself now because they did not play well in their first series. They had the ball at midfield. And Northwestern's taking control of this football game. Now they have a third and ten. If they don't convert here, they could be very much in jeopardy of losing any opportunity to win this game. This is a young team. Their psyche is so fragile at times. A blitz! And they get there. Snuffing the quarterback Raider right at the 16-yard line. Yeah, Kevin Buck came right through. Number nine initially completely untouched over the right tackle gap. Casey Daly also in the neighborhood on the tackle, John, number 36. Yeah, watch nine come through. See, he's completely unblocked. He's the guy that forces Raider up, and then, as you said, Daly comes through and finishes him off. And Raider, a little dangerous with that football. You know, he's a big, strong kid. I think he wanted to Roman Gabriel and try and muscle it out of there. <laughs> this is Kruger with the punt. Musso back at the 49. Brian Musso has room. Musso with one man to beat. Musso, touchdown. For the second week in a row, Brian Musso runs one back, and this time there are no flags on the play. What a difference a week makes, doesn't it? Last week, you're right, it gets called back. That could have perhaps iced the game against Wake Forest. Today, it puts them up by 21 points. But all great punt returners set up the return by starting one way and going the other way. Watch how he starts a little bit to his right, just enough to set some blocks. Then he changes direction again, and that allows more blocks to get set. And then good runners in the open field can always put that move on the punter. John Kruger has no chance as he's locked up downfield. And the extra point is good. Northwestern now leading 32 to 10, courtesy of Mr. Musso. Musso showed his skills as a receiver on the previous touchdown right before the half, and he shows us his skills here in the open field. Look how he's just looking around, and he has the speed to get into the end zone. Brian Musso, John, is an athlete who says <laughs> his favorite class is the class that gets canceled. <laughs> well, at least he's honest about it. You know? School's in because he took Duke to school on that punt return. And he's having a very productive day from the all-purpose yardage department. And two touchdowns you can add to those uh, all-purpose yards, along with everything else he's done today. His father, Johnny, a standout at Alabama. They played there in the late 60s. I guess they're heading to uh, calculus class now. Back huh? to the library. <laughs> a couple more Adams to split. Eight minutes remaining in the third quarter. Duke trailing. Gary Barnett has his team stoked right now. He may have said something at halftime. He has creative ways of motivating his team. Very creative ways. Like how to handle the past and how to handle the present. Here's what he had to say about it. We brought every player up that had received any postseason award last year. And this was the first day of spring practice. And um, I had a, a placard made up that had each one of their awards. And we brought them up one at a time. And our team applauded them. And, and I, I had my awards on a placard. And kids applauded for me. And we had a big waste can there. And uh, it said 95 on it. And behind us on an overhead was uh, the 1996 All Big Ten football team, in which there was no names on that list. And uh, then after we applauded each one of us, uh, one at a time, we stuck that placard that represented what we did a year ago into the waste can that represented a year ago. And went back into our meetings and started, started off practice in our meetings, business as usual. 
a very graphic way, an effective way, albeit, of how to handle the pass and put it in perspective. Yeah, I, I really think that's an interesting. I, you know, he had 18 National Coach of the Year honors bestowed on him last year, so he must have been up there half an hour himself putting those things in the wastebasket. <laughs> Although I'm sure that at some point somebody retrieved it from the waistband. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot of hardware to throw away, pardon me. Yeah, the guy with the shopping carriage came over to take it to the <laughs> junk collector. A pickup of 13 yards on that last pass and a first down. Another completion to Hodrick. Well, Duke is not messing around here. They realize they're down substantially by 22 points in this game, and they're not going to try anything other than to just open it up and, and run maybe a, a loose version of a two-minute drill. But they quickly get two first downs here, and they're their first two first downs of the third quarter. A look at the passing by half. Raider not nearly as effective here in the third quarter. But, John, I've been impressed with the front seven of Northwestern so far in the second half. I have a they, little they, bit of pressure. Yeah, they've turned it up. Uh, and I think that uh, rightfully so, their coach Gary Barnett put the pressure on them. 7-19 remaining in the third quarter. Three wide receivers out for Duke. They come back with the waggle again. Raider intended for Marshall incomplete at the 42-yard line. Stops the clock with 7-11 remaining in the period. You know, that was a reverse version of the big play that Marshall hit earlier in the uh, first quarter of this football game where uh, Raider hit him down the sideline on the back side of that waggle. If everything on the front side for the quarterback is covered, he's smart enough to go backfield. And, you know, when you fake to somebody like Marshall, the running back, often that is the guy who's forgotten by the defense. They say, oh, he doesn't have the ball. Let's go find out who's going to get it. Well, we'll see who gets it on this play, John. Second down and 10, four wideouts for Duke. And Raider tucks it under, flagged down at the 40. Raider run out of bounds at midfield at the 50-yard line. But there may have been a hold on the play back at the 38-yard line. You know, Kevin Buck came on the identical blitz that was successful before, as we see the holding call being called by Steve Payman. And they'll bring this one back. Duke, with that young offensive line, did well for all intents and purposes in the first half. Here's the call. Holding. Offense, 10-yard penalty from the spot of the foul, replay, second down. You know, see, that's the problem. When you have a single back offense, you don't have the luxury of having two backs in there to pick up the blitz. So if the linemen don't slide over and protect properly or pick up their schemes, you're going to have guys coming through free. Right now, there's nobody in the backfield. So a blitz comes, it's got to be handled completely by the line. Second down and 26 to go. Five wideouts for Duke. Raider looked like it was supposed to be a quarterback draw. Not sure. Casey Daly made the tackle. Uh, young people up front, John, for Duke. Gannett Shepard fires out on the left side, on the right side. He probably should have. Uh, accounted for Casey Daly. I think he assumed Daly was going to rush up field and he was going to get the second level block. That's just a play where the experience of Daly, who's a senior, certainly used his keys and thought this is the kind of play they could run. Third down and Chapel Hill to go. 6.20 remaining in the third quarter. Raider complete to, out of the backfield to Marshall. Breaks two tackles, finally brought down at the 37-yard line and they will have to punt. You can almost sense some of the steam coming out of Duke's sales right now. Barnes and Gardner on the tackle. Let's check in with John Saunders in New York. All right, Mark, thanks a lot. In this game of the day, Michigan and Colorado, Michigan drives again after a bad punch. Scott drives back to Jeremy Tooman. Three yards, 2013 now the lead. All right, John, back here, 32 to 10. 540 remaining. Kruger punting. Musso, who returned the last one for a touchdown, gets it at the 15. Musso looking for room, but can't find any this time. Brought down at the 23-yard line, a 48-yard punt, and five on the return. Steve Schnurr back in the ball game to lead the offense, and downstairs to Dean for more on him. Well, guys, all quarterbacks grip the football differently, and mostly it depends on your hand size. Steve Schnurr is a relatively small guy, 6 feet, 195, with average size hands. He holds the ball like this, his index finger on the tip, and 
I haven't seen many guys do that with smaller hands. And Troy Aikman is one, and Terry Bradshaw way back when was another one who did it. But he told me before the game, this is the natural grip for him. He experimented with many of it, and it seems to work pretty well. And, John, I really like his release. It's different this year than in the past, it appears. That's right, Dean. It is. They've worked on his release. And Adrian Autry releases out of the backfield on the run for the first down out to the 36-yard line. Nice burst of speed by the 5-foot, 10-inch, 190-pound junior. Settles making the tackle that time in the secondary. Dean had talked about Schnur's release. Craig Johnson, the quarterback coach, has worked with him to keep his elbows in tighter, use more of his torso to have a more compact delivery. He said, you know, before his elbows used to flop out when he threw the football, we've worked and strengthened his arm, and he actually has thrown the ball a lot better from this uh, type of delivery. And here comes the counterplay to Adrian Autry. Darnell still on the sidelines. A. Autry brought down to the 36-yard line. Tackled by McQueen. This is Craig Johnson. He gets the plays up top from Greg Meyer, who's calling a great game today, and then he or another quarterback will signal those plays in. And one of them is live, and one of them is a dummy. Maybe you could pan to the right a little bit, and we'll see if uh, we see the other quarterback. But that way, there's a scheme, and nobody can really steal their signals. Maybe they're not as concerned here in the ACC, but I, I bet you they do it in the Big Ten. They, they have two people signaling in. And they are trying to throw a little bit more this year. Second down and nine. They throw on this one. Drexler complete at the 38-yard line. The clock running settles again, making the tackle for Duke. 4-12 remaining in the third quarter. And this is why you want a quick delivery if you're a quarterback. There's no time. Watch out. He's just got to get rid of that thing. It was tight. He threw it out. There it comes. It's tight to his arm. He throws the thing out, just flicks it out there with that arm strength and avoids the sack. And that's not, you know... A lot of times you can't throw it the way you exactly want to, stepping into it with people right in your face. So Schnur does an excellent job of just getting rid of the football, getting something positive out of the play. Schnur facing third down and seven here. The blitz, they pick it up. And a nice hit by number 13, Clark, on Lavelle Brown, number 34. Short of the first down at the 42. Clark really closed nicely, put his hat on the player. And it'll be fourth down punting situation for Coach Barnett and Northwestern. Paul Burton in to punt for Northwestern. His first punt of the afternoon. Here's a guy who in 94 was first team all Big Ten. And last year had 19 punts inside the 20-yard line. Two fifty-five remaining in the third quarter. Burton hangs it up high. Man, is that high. Gates hit immediately, and a flag goes down at the 17-yard line. Let's see if that's the two-yard rule. Buddy, or Adam Geis, I call him Buddy because I know his father. He coached for the Green Bay Packers when I was there. He's now with uh, Lindy Infante with the Indianapolis Colts. One of the best receiver coaches I've ever been around. He molded uh, Sterling Sharp when he was there, and you know what kind of receiver he turned out to be. Sure. Kick catch interference, violation of the two-yard radius. Kicking team, five-yard penalty from the spot of the foul. Nice First spot. down. Fred Wilkerson, number 21, got there just a touch early in the official's eyes. And the pros, there's no specific distance. You just have to allow somebody to catch it. In college, they say two yards. Let's see how close Wilkerson is when he catches this football. Here it comes. Boom. Now, I'd say that's within two yards. Yeah, he was so close he could tell what flavor gum Wilkerson was chewing. <laughs> Man, where do you come up with this stuff, huh? <laughs> Spearman. 2.44 remaining in the third quarter. And onto the field again comes Matt Rader. He's gone the distance at quarterback for Duke. Single back set. Back to pass. He's going to run it now. Doesn't have much foot speed, but manages to make it out to the 28-yard line. About three yards short of the first down. Kevin Buck, the Hawk linebacker, making the tackle that time. Monday night, folks, 
Al Michaels hosts an action-packed, heart-stopping primetime special, the greatest sports moments of all time. And then Jim Kelly and the Buffalo Bills traveled to Three Rivers Stadium to avenge last year's playoff loss against Pittsburgh on ABC's NFL Monday Night Football. Who do you like in that game, partner? I'll tell you, I like the Steelers playing at home, and uh, Tom Zach, I think, has settled that team down, and I, Bill Cowers, I think, one of the better coaches. And last one is picked off, John. Schmidt, Tor Schmidt, just swallowed, engulfed that ball. He used all of that 6-3 frame to haul in the pass and showed a lot of dexterity for a defensive lineman. <laughs> this play actually is not on the quarterback, it's on the left tackle. The left tackle in quick protection, hold it here, has got to fire out and knock the legs down of Tor Schmidt, not allow him to jump up in the field. Instead, he backs up, go after his legs and attack him. Then he can't jump up in the air like that. But in, by retreating, the tackle allowed him to get up in the air and jump up. That's a mistake Gannon Shepard, the freshman tackle, made that cost his quarterback. And the turnover story is being the big story of the day. Duke committing four of them to Northwestern's one. Duke working once again with a short field. Darnell Autry back in the ball game, running it down to the 17-yard line with 1.50 to play in the third quarter. Northwestern leading 32 to 10. Looking for its first win of the 1996 season. So the turnovers have cost the Blue Devils two weeks in a row now, four last week, four again this week, and they can't play that kind of football and win too many games. 125 remaining in the quarter. Darnell Autry. He seems to have lost a step, John. What do you think? Is he tired? Is he hurting? Didn't seem to be quite as explosive, or maybe it was a situation on that play where he was just waiting for a hole to develop. Well, Ken and Holly was in hot pursuit. That's one thing. And, and secondly, the way they run their zone plays, he has to not run to the hole too quickly. He has to wait for things to develop. But he looks like he's nursing some soreness in his legs, ankle or whatever. And Raider, meanwhile, contemplating what happened on that last interception. Yeah, that's a ball that should not be intercepted. And a quarterback's got to have confidence there. And that's, that's just working the pass set out with the timing and the rhythm of a quarterback. If it's a three-step drop, the linemen have to keep those hands down because the quarterback doesn't have any separation. Adrian Autry in the ball for Darnell, in the game for Darnell. And this is Adrian Autry out of the backfield. He appears to have the first down at the 10-yard line. Chike making the tackle. Ebunue with 1.11 to play in the third quarter. Nose of the ball in the 10-yard line. Northwestern with an opportunity here to put some more distance between themselves and Duke. Toussaint Waterman coming out of the ball game. They are calling it first and goal to go. Brown and Adrian Autry lining up out of the eye. This is Autry on the ISO. Just a straightforward lead play. And Adrian Autry down to the three. That's power football there. Lavelle Brown on an excellent lead block out of the fullback position. And it looks like Darnell's checking back into the game. I like the way they rotate those two backs in and out of the ball game. Always have a set of fresh legs in there. Well, with the demands they put on their running back, I mean, the, the fullback in this offense is just primarily a blocker and an occasional receiver. You need to have a fresh body that you can put in there. And that is Tor Schmidt, the guy who set up this drive with the interception. Autry, oh my. Darnell into the end zone. A touchdown lunge to hit pay dirt. That is a monument to effort. Well, it really is. I mean, he gets into the game. He's got a little bit of fresh leg. We saw him limping off. But this is where the strength and the power that he picked up in the offseason with those five extra pounds is paying off. In the late part of the third quarter, he gets pumped, he gets rocked. But he knows where the end zone is, and he gets the ball over the end zone. Gowan's in for the extra point. And it has been an adventure for the Wildcats today. We are putting a thrill back into the extra point in this game, aren't we? <laughs> Not the kind of thrill that head coaches like. 
Darnell Autry, 23 rushes today, 157 yards and a pair of touchdowns. His coach had this to say about number 24. He makes other guys play better and harder. And uh, in fact, I have to be careful with it because I find the 69 other guys all standing around waiting for Darnell to make the play instead of them getting involved. They want to watch him play. So um, uh, he just brings a special intensity to it. You know, in some respects, that can kind of work like the Michael Jordan syndrome where yeah. teammates stand around and wait for Michael to make the play, or in this case, Darnell Autry. But to their credit this afternoon, John, that hasn't been the case. No, nope. Brian Musso stepped up and made some big plays. He actually made big plays last week. So there's, there's a lot of talent. Patrick Bates, there's a lot of talent on this offense. But again, this guy is the epicenter of that talent. Everything revolves around him. Darnell Autry. No truth to the rumor that he carries around a sign in his bag that reads, we'll act for food. <laughs> Flowers and Montgomery back for the kick. Montgomery, who fumbled and had a turnover earlier, takes the knee. And turnovers have really hurt Duke this season, resulting in 43 points. Yeah, that's, I mean, when you look at it, I mean, that's five something, five, almost five and a half points every turnover. I mean, that, you just take that and say, okay, I'm going to give you 20 points. Let's start this football game. It's just not going to, not going to work out for Duke. They're just not that good of a football team. But this is a young team, and it's a team that's only going to get better and better. And frankly, I think they've uh, shown a pretty good uh, representation of what the future holds for both the offensive and the defensive side of this football team. John Rader still in the ball game for Duke with three seconds to play in the third quarter. Gives it to Lamar Marshall, who steps out to the 22-yard line, tackled by number 51. And he, number 51 hangs up four fingers, saying the fourth quarter will be ours. It's been there so far. We'll return with more after this message and a word from our ABC stage. A brand new season for a second, Noah, and you won't believe what happens in the season premiere then. Tom Hanks stars in the movie that brings down the house, The Money Pit, all tonight, right here, you know where, on ABC. 15 minutes to play in the fourth quarter. First play of the quarter, Duke with the ball, second and nine at the 21-yard line. Raider throws complete, tackled at the 30-yard line. John Saunders back in New York. All right, Mark, it's time for the Burger King College Football Play of the Day, a controversial one, 10-9 game. And East Carolina elects to go for the victory in regulation instead of kicking the extra point and going to overtime. Marcus Crandall's pass is incomplete, so West Virginia walks away with the win. Mark. And, John, you can hear the phone lines lighten up on the local sports radio talk show. I can bet about the scissor by the coach. Sometimes as a coach, you roll the dice, and it works. Sometimes it doesn't. And this time, Duke on first and 10 out to the 37-yard line. Fitzgerald making the tackle on Rico Owens. Two prestigious schools battling it out on the gridiron this afternoon. Well, you need high, and I mean high SAT scores, even to be looked at, to be considered. 14-10 remaining in the fourth period. Raider to pass. Raider wrapped up, and Raider brought down at the 33-yard line. That Northwestern defense here in the second half has really begun to assert itself. John Burns, the 6'5 junior, making the tackle. And this is the group of schools that you could say fit into the same category with Duke and Northwestern. Stanford, Army, Vanderbilt, Tulane, Rice. And you know what? A lot of them, and Navy and Rice is enjoying some success, or has under Ken Hatfield. Duke Northwestern, of course. Stanford has been to a couple of bowls uh, in this decade. And, and with the 85 scholarship rule, Mark, I, I believe that more of these schools will enjoy more success. That's a good point. It really evens things out. The pass complete at the 39-yard line. Speaking of Vanderbilt, John Saunders has an update on them. John? Well, Mark, facing Alabama today, Vanderbilt, as you know, gave Notre Dame fits in the first game of the year, and it's Jason Dunavant who takes this one in from eight yards out. Vanderbilt on the board first, 7-zip. Mark? 
One of those guys with the high SATs with the touchdown, huh? <laughs> hey, Vandy gave Notre Dame a battle 14 to 7. They fell last week. They might have a very good football team. Back here, it's first and 10. 13.06 remaining. Blitz coming by Northwestern. And Rayner gets it away. It's incomplete. And he was lucky to get it away. Although he did get tackled hard back at the 47 yard line. It was intended for Wilkes. It'll be second down and 10. Raiders starting to take a beating now on offense for Duke. And most of the people here are beginning to file out if they haven't already. Duke down 38 to 10. At Cameron Indoor Stadium, where the basketball team plays, they stay right till the very end. Not quite the same situation. Must be a calculus class going on somewhere. Find the area under the curve, I guess, is the big question of the day. And that's a look at Cameron right there <laughs> in the top left-hand corner of the screen. What a great place to watch basketball, isn't it, Mark? Yep. Fitzgerald is talking about football in a big way. The 6'2", 235-pound senior making the tackle on Wilkes. He's the guy that promised today's result would be different. Big number 51 right in the middle of your screen. He reads well. He dissects plays well. And he just attacks the football based on alignment, runs around the block from the backside, and runs down that play. Fitzgerald is a guy you'll definitely be seeing playing sometime on Monday nights. And Fitzgerald's a guy that got in each and every one of his teammates' faces after that disappointing loss last week. Raider over the middle, complete to number 14, Mark Wilson, making his first catch of the day. Leary in on the tackle, the backup strong safety. Wilson, the 6'3 senior, 200 pounds, caught 47 passes last year. Good size at the flanker spot. And that led the team. So it's hard to believe he hasn't caught a ball until now. But they're going to go for it on fourth down, as I don't think that's any surprise to anybody. Raider trying to build a little confidence, maybe looking ahead to the future just a bit. It is fourth down and six. Raider has room for the first down, gets a good block, and he got it. He got a good block at the 29-yard line. Josh Barnes made the tackle. Jeff Hodrick gave his quarterback a lot of help, John Spagnola. Hodrick to split out of just a little bit outside. There you see, just at the top of your screen is where Hodrick is standing up. Raider not at all hesitant to pull the thing down if he sees everybody with the deep blocks, and that's the block you alluded to, Hodrick flying across the screen, and Raider gets the first down. Hodrick this time set up to the right in the slot of Raider, and he's the intended receiver, and it's almost picked off by Pat Fitzgerald. Pat Fitzgerald was talking the talk before the game, and he is walking the walk this afternoon. He's playing well, breaking up yet another attempt. There's Fitzgerald, you can see him in the middle of the screen, and he's gonna tape a deeper drop. See how he just locates Hodrick? Knew where the tight end was going with the ball, ran his drop to that area and got to the spot where the ball was gonna be thrown. And that's experience once again by Pat Fitzgerald. But he's gonna take a little deeper drop now because of the point differential and the time of the game. Raider tucks it under again. Breaks one tackle. Brought down at the 14-yard line by Eric Collier, the strong safety. You know, Mark, he may not be all that fleet of foot, but he's got strength. You know, he's been able to lunge on three or four occasions today and use his strength to get that first down. A big kid, 6'5", 220. You mentioned that. And here's a look. And he uses blockers well, too, John. Yeah, he does. Right here is where he's got that strength, and he gets a little bit extra yards. Are we making an, an option guy like Dean Blevins? Dean's never thrown a pass, has he? <laughs> well, we saw his grip anyway. <laughs> That's about all they saw at Oklahoma. Raider hits Marshall, who slips and falls at the 12-yard line, about eight yards short of the first down. Kevin Buck, the Hawk linebacker, with the coverage. It'll be second down, about eight to go. 10.33 to play here at Durham, North Carolina. Matt Raider making his first start of the season last week was 4 of 11. 
His numbers today, much better. Yeah, look at that, almost 300 yards. And the two interceptions, remember, one I thought was the def or the offensive tackle's fault. The other one occurred early in the game, and the receiver went too far over into the end zone, Jeff Hodrick. So I think he's had himself quite a day. Raider, a National Merit Scholar. Dropping back to pass a blitz, and they sack him at the 21-yard line. Kevin Buck isn't passing the buck. He did it himself. A loss of eight yards on the play. Buck is one defender that Duke has had difficulty accounting for. Buck number nine should be coming right off here, and let's see if anybody picks him up in this pass blocking scheme. No, Chapel number 66 goes inside. So again, nobody's able to get there in front of Buck, and he's able to get the uh, clear beat on the quarterback. Third down and 15 now. Single back set. Raider has a man, a touchdown. No, and now it's ruled incomplete. He seemed to have it for just a moment. Rico Owens couldn't squeeze it, though. That's a shame for Duke, because that was a play that was well-designed. Raider delivers the football, and Rico Owens is behind the secondary. He had the secondary beat. And he's not able to hold on to the football. A disappointed young man. Owens, a true sophomore, will no doubt learn from that mistake. Sims Lenhart in for the field goal attempt from 38 yards out. He's had one block today. This one has the distance and is good. So Lenhart knocks it through from 38 yards out. But what could have been. Rico Owens. Come on, Rico, hold on, hold on. Nope. No, no, no control. Good call by the official. Not quite Rico Owens. Looking for divine intervention? <laughs> Not on that play. We'll be right back. Living on ABC, Robbie Gordon and 11 of the world top drivers meet in Michigan to take the final challenge of the IROC series. Then, at 4 Eastern, 3 Central and Pacific, Ari Leyendijk and the stars of the Indy Racing League roll the dice in the desert at the Las Vegas Motor Speedway. That's all tomorrow on ABC Sports. 9.17 remaining here at Durham, North Carolina. I'm Mark Jones along with John Spagnola and Dean Blevins. Northwestern came out early, set the tone with the Darnell Autry running play for a touchdown. The first of a couple of touchdowns for him this afternoon, and they lead 38 to 13. Autry now with all-purpose yardage in his bag, racking up some more. Pushed out of bounds at the 23. By Brian Krenzel. Well, here's Rico Owens, the play that he dropped in the end zone. He's going to simply run a corner route to the end zone, and he gets behind the secondary. And Raider does an excellent job of recognizing it, getting the ball high up in the air, over the corner, over the safety, who takes a poor angle to the football. And Rico just can't hold on to the football. Look like Rico Suave on that one. Tim Hughes now in. In at quarterback. Busy day in college football. Washington and BYU playing a big game out west. And John Saunders has an update for us. John. Updating the BYU-Washington matchup. BYU had a field goal in the second half to get back within 11, but then Shane Fortney, 29 yards to J Dave Janoski for the touchdown, and Washington has now opened up a 17-point lead. Mark. You've got to be careful of BYU, though, John, because don't you think they like those high-scoring shootout-type games? Ask Texas A&M. They know. Yeah, they opened well against A&M, but again, kind of a reverse of what happened here today. Washington's waiting for them. They're coming off the loss to Arizona State. You know, they want to go after a ranked team, and, and they're playing very well at home today. New quarterback in, as we mentioned earlier, Tim Hughes. Hanging the ball off. That's Adrian Autry. The two Autrys have teamed up very well in the backfield today. Stoking that running game for the Wildcats. Pollock and Stallmeyer making the tackle that time. 8.05 remaining in the fourth quarter. The prospects you know, of overtime in this game relatively <laughs> slim right now. If it was, it'd be the biggest comeback since, uh, well, biggest turnaround anyway, since Paul on the road to Damascus. 
<laughs> oh my God. I that was Bible. a while ago, too. I don't know. That was, that was definitely in the, uh, not in the modern era of football. Who did Paul play for, huh? <laughs> yeah, right. Hughes hands it off to Adrian Autry, who is out to the 38-yard line. Tawambi settles with the tackle on the play. Settles from Chattanooga, Tennessee. He's played a good game this afternoon defensively for the Blue Devils. Well, you know, he took over from Ray Farmer, and I think he's playing much the way Ray Farmer did at free safety. Farmer is now with the Philadelphia Eagles, and Tawambi Settles came up from strong safety to free safety and just asserts himself on the football field. You got an idea of his athletic ability when he blocked that field goal. Really getting up in the air on the play. 7-16 to play. Hughes hands it off to Autry. That's Adrian. The A-train. Out to the 46, tackled by Wells, Settle. number six, settles again. We talked about settles just a few seconds ago. John, how difficult a transition is it for number six to go from strong to free safety? Not all that difficult. A lot of times in college football, the safeties will play halves or they'll play thirds, and they're, they're pretty similar. And then with formation changes and motion, you wind up going actually from strong to free safety by alignment, but uh, he's starting out in that free safety position anyway. It's not, not that much of adjustment because you have to know what everybody else is doing. 6.32 remaining in the ball game. Hughes hands it off to Autry. Adrian Autry racking up some yardage statistics down to the 48-yard line. And uh, hold on, is this a rerun? Settles again on the tackle. Maybe the two of them should just get on a field by themselves. Adrian Autry with 14 rushes today for a total of 73 yards. Six ten remaining. Duke with the ball. Trying to end with a positive impression on the field. Adrian Autry one more time. And guess what? This time, Settles didn't make the tackle. The honor goes to Ryan Stallmeyer. Notre Dame thrashing Purdue, vanquishing Purdue, 35 to nothing. And don't forget that next week they are part of a double dip on ABC. They take on number seven, Texas, then at 3.30 Eastern, Georgia Tech against North Carolina, big ACC clash. Boston College meets Michigan, who's battling Colorado right now, another game being played on ABC, and at last word, they were leading Colorado. Other regional action, so call your cable operator for the games available. Adrian Autry one more time out to the 37-yard line, and Tawambi Settles is going to be the first guy for Duke in line for the Whirlpool. <laughs> There's that Michigan score up by seven. Now, let me ask a question. Do Cordell Stewart and Michael Westbrook still play <laughs> for Colorado? They're, they're gone now, right? One more here. Slash, here, yeah. Slash is at Pittsburgh, and Westbrook is at the Redskins. And don't think for a second that Michigan hasn't forgotten about that. <laughs> That's been the talk of the football world this week. 5.15 to play in the fourth quarter, and they are measuring for the first down. Duke with the ball. A lot of, a lot of exciting things happening. A lot of exciting things happening at Northwestern. They're building some new facilities there, expanding the stadium, building a new weight room. New coaching offices, everything should be finished by next fall of 97. And that program really coming into prominence a year ago, and they are hoping to build on that this season. Gary Barnett, the head coach, recently signing a 12-year contract extension. That, my friend, is security. And he has choosed UCLA and chose to stay at Northwestern, where it was something special. And he wanted to continue to be a part of that. Mark, you know, we were involved in that uh, wonderful game for Northwestern anyway when Ohio State was upset by Michigan. You were doing the game itself. Right. I was at the Nicolette Center with the entire team. And, you know, that was an exciting thing to be a part of, to just feel the people coming together there in Evanston, Illinois, when they realized they were going to go to the Rose Bowl for the first time in 47 years. But this is 96, you gotta start that all over again. And he is now the hunted. Have you ever heard of Triska Decophobia, John? 
No, I haven't. Well, I'm going to tell you what it means. It's a fear of Friday the 13th, and yesterday was, by chance, Friday the 13th, so maybe some of those demons and bad luck charms coming out for Duke. Tristan Deffen. Count the syllables. That's Audrey. <laughs> Adrian Audrey. I got the Triska. It must be the, the 13. Deca is the year. And then Phobia. Okay. In the midst of academia. You're not winging it, man. Things, things just happen when you're in academia here, you know. Hey, you can wing that at some of these other schools. But here, <laughs> I'd be very, very cautious to try and wing anything. Still figuring out Archimedes' principle <laughs> with four minutes remaining in the ball game. Yeah, we'll send you in the bathtub again. You can figure it out. <laughs> It does have to do with the displacement of water. There's those demons we talked about. <laughs> 336 remaining. And Duke pounding away still. Defensively. Stolmeyer on the side. You know, making the tackle. Yeah, we talked about Fred Goldsmith and his recruiting base and everything else. Uh, you know, the one thing about Duke is uh, I took a look at their roster. 21 players are from North Carolina, 17 from Florida. And you'd alluded to the Florida base, and he has some roots to go back there. Nine Georgia, eight Pennsylvania, seven New Jersey, seven from Texas. So there, there's definitely a national appeal, or at least a super regional appeal. He has three players from California. But east of the Mississippi, a lot of people will look at Duke University and their parents really push them to come to this school. Those are the kids that he says he needs. Archery, nice cut inside, flag down. Maybe in a hold or a clip back at the 31-yard line. We'll wait and see. Pollock, scratch that, Pollock making the tackle. Holding is the call against the Wildcats. Well, time permitting, folks, stay tuned for the Thrifty Car Rental Post Game Report featuring scores and highlights from across the country on a busy Saturday afternoon in college football. Often, 10 yard penalty from the spot of the foul. Gary Barnett, as you mentioned, turned down overtures from UCLA last year after their season. He was telling us earlier, John, that he felt it was just the right thing to do for him to come back because his decision would have affected not only his family, but the families of his assistant coaches. And it's something that weighed heavily on his mind at the time. Well, and, and you recruit the kids, you bring them into the school, and then suddenly, you know, you exit through the trap door. It just it leaves the team in a state of disarray. And I'm pleased to see he's going to stay there for a long time. He's a quality individual, uh, along with being an excellent football coach. Autry down to the 41-yard line, brought down by Settles. But you know what he has to deal with now, and that's, you know, he's raised the bar. The expectation bar is very high for Gary Barnett and his team. So people in Chicago, you know, the media's a pretty good crunch there. and They, you know, they expect, after that loss last week, I'm sure there were a lot of people jumping off that bandwagon. Yep. The reward for a job well done is often more responsibility and higher expectations. Double-edged sword, Paul Burton into punt. Guys, the return man standing on his 10. 142 remaining in the ball game. You can color this day purple. Northwestern will leave Durham, North Carolina with a win and improve to one and one on the season. And they take a penalty on fourth down. Prior to the snap, delay of game, offense. Penalty is declined. It's still fourth down. We've been talking about this being the slide ruler bowl. I want to mention that in 1996, the average freshman SAT here at Duke, the average SAT score was between 1350 and 1400. Well, that's what you got. You just took the exam twice, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, a cumulative total. <laughs> <laughs> Burden to butt. And anything in the air that long should have a movie on it. That was high. <laughs> Burton lets it roll down to the eight yard line with 125 to play in Durham, North Carolina. It's all purple and white. Eight for the smart, the intelligent, thrifty. 
Brewer Fresh Budweiser, who reminds you fresh beer tastes better. And Chili's Grill and Bar, home of the Big Mouth Burgers. Now look at some of the wonderful scenery here in North Carolina, Durham, North Carolina, on campus at Duke University. Rustic beauty here in the Piedmont country. Went for a jog through campus a couple of days ago. And Raider is brought down at the five yard line. It's time to just tee off for that Northwestern defense. Not letting up at all, even in the waning moments of the game. Jeff Dyra, Jeff Dyra making the tackle. You have to admire that, and certainly gives Raider an opportunity to work on a two-minute offense, which he has never done in a live situation before. Raider this time firing incomplete at the 22-yard line. It'll be third down. Broken up by number 21, Fred Richardson. 59 seconds to play. Raider this afternoon, 27 of 46 for a total of 290 yards. Those two interceptions hurt a little bit, although he did have one touchdown pass. 15 yards to go on third down for Duke. They run it. Probably because they were so backed up into the end zone or close to it. Anwan Jones making the tackle with 46 seconds to play. Fourth down, and in comes the punting unit. Fred Goldsmith, if he continues to pull talented players out of Florida with those Florida connections, this team will be all right. And two years from now, there'll be somebody to watch oh, yeah. as that talent matures. But he's a former coach at Florida A&M, grew up in the Miami area. Right. So he's got good ties. Graduated from Florida. Coached in the high school ranks there. And then you're right, he spent five years at Florida A&M. So he has some ties down there. And, and as he said, more importantly, he can appeal. This, this university appeals to the mothers and fathers. And it appears as if they will let the clock run out rather than punt. As time ticks off, Northwestern will improve to 1-1. One one. Duke falling to 0-2. The story of the game, third quarter offensive firepower by Northwestern. The genuine Chevrolet MVPs, Brian Musso of Northwestern and Matt Rader are from Duke. Chevrolet will donate $1,000 to each general scholarship fund to award outstanding students for their academic achievements and to assist those in financial need. It's been a Chevrolet tradition for more than a quarter of a century. We'll be back. The final score once again, Northwestern 38, Duke 13.